I hope you enjoyed the light good lunch we had thanks to the Comitato Nazionale per le celebrazioni del centenario Sciasciano. After a very interesting morning, I think we can share this opinion. And so we went to the myth of American literature and culture, come, and then we came back to the myth of Mediterranean ancestral uh, culture of the Western society. And this afternoon, he is really rich, and we are very happy to have different sessions on translation. That's absolutely important, especially because coming to New York or living in the US, we are realizing that Shasha probably should be reprinted and probably should be retranslated with some critical apparatus that can help our students or younger, spe younger people to read and to approach the weird <laughs> society of Sicily. And understanding even, I remember a good conversation with Giulia Pellizzato that we'll present tomorrow, that she was wondering, how can we translate the silence of Shasha and so the Sicilian silence? They, and so how we can even, and you perfectly know, how can we approach the dialects and things that are in between the lines and then in Sicily are very important, but when we translate, probably we find the gap to bring in another language. So that will be, I think, one of the topic of our next session. They'll see uh, Joseph Farrell as uh, translator, as uh, rock star, as <laughs> author of the book that we are constantly referred to because it's our news, is our uh, plane to uh, New York, actually. And then we have the pleasure to have Anne Goldstein today that Amara Lacuz was just quoting about, about her translation of his novel. And then we have James Marcos at the New York University that translated, that's strange, man. <laughs> he translated Sicily as a metaphor. And we are very happy about that because we have the need to translate even this kind of inquiries, essays of Shash in the United States to help keep going the conversation of, on this author. So I would like to invite Anne Goldstein, James Marcos, and Joe Farrell, please. I would add a chair for you. Here, so we can have the round table that we entitled Translating Shasha in English. So please help me to welcome our speakers. And thank you very much for accepting our invitation on this very critical, important, relevant topic. Thank you. This one working? Which one is working? One, two, three, four. That's very professional to do that. So it shows, shows a command of mathematics as well as. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Hello. Are you finished? Well, I'm just done. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Yeah, just. <laughs> Am I just a silent I think, one? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. First of all, upset somebody comes in the way. All right. Um, as I thought to say, I'm always slightly uncomfortable about discussing. This has now become translation studies, an enormous subject inside the universities. I'm sure as much in the United States as it is in Britain. Um, and I was struck by a phrase by Umberto Eco, who else, who said, La traduzione è la lingua dell'Europa, and he went on to point out that in the European Parliament there are 28 official languages in use. My problem is basically this, um, that really you have to break down translation into the genre. You've got poetry, you have prose, and prose can be subdivided into fiction and um, factual. You've theatre, and then you also have cinema. 
Now, I'm going to completely leave aside poetry because it's um, something which I cannot do. Um, I like an American novelist who's not very well known in America, John Crowley. He too won a Flyano Prize, by the way, when I was on the jury, since Flyano has come up a few times, um, for a book called The Interpreter, which is a very good novel and um, discusses obviously the position of a female interpreter with a Russian poet who arrives in the United States. He says you can't translate poetry, all you can do is write a new poem. And that, I think, is probably true. In any case, I don't do that. You have the various other things. I've translated cinema. Um, Giuseppe Tornatori was kind enough to write an introduction to my book. And when I translated a film of his, which was called The Correspondence, um, and which he wished to shoot in English, um, but then he knew that although he was shooting the film with Anglophone stars, then his main market was going to be um, Italy. So I translated this beautifully, as I thought, into some quite moving, delicate prose, in my opinion, bringing out the real force and the poetry of the dialogue. I discovered to my dismay that as I was speaking at the lines, he was counting. And the only thing he was counting was the number of syllables um, in the individual speech. Because the film was not going to be was going to be dubbed and not to subtitles. So he did not want to have the act of continuing to speak when the um, words that came out uh, had run out or the reverse. So my beautiful uh, prose, although I say it, you should not. My beautiful prose ended up in the bin in favour of a mathematical exercise which meant the syllables co corresponded. Um, Theatre is what I most like translating, as a matter of fact. So we're <laughs> going to be talking about Shasha and Liva. I like the collaborative element of working with uh, theatre. You will nowadays be working with a figure known as the dramaturg, um, and with the director, and then, if you're lucky, also with the actors, um, who are not just uh, machines that learn, they're interested in what's going on. However, we then have um, prose. And once again, you've got to um, divide it. The absolutely worst thing, and it's a pity that Dante, if it had happened, Dante would have used it as one of his circles of hell, was to have people translating academic Italian into English. Um, uh, Dante would unquestionably have some of the gravest sinners in the lowest part of hell sitting facing something done by professor, whatever it is, in the university, whatever. That is the uh, position of hell. Fiction is a different matter. All right. Um, we said that one of the things, and it's already come up this morning, um, that um, he would talk about dialogue. Now, Let's see, first of all, that the mission of the translator can best be conveyed by image, and you can use your own word. The translator is a cross-border messenger, he's an aerial who brings peace, he's a ghost in an equity, all these things are fine. The one which I find most appropriate was produced by a German thinker and translator, Franz Rosenweig. Um, he was Jewish, and he did translations of the Bible which, by the way, is really where um, a lot of tr translation uh, uh, begins. And he produced the phrase that the translator is the servant of two masters. And for people of a knowledge of Italian literature, especially Italian theatre, this will immediately bring up the um, image of Carlo Goldoni uh, with his famous play. And I quite like that, the idea of the translation as a kind of harlequin figure. It stops translators getting above themselves or thinking too highly of themselves. You've got to be aware of these two situations. But we said we'd talk a bit about um, uh, talk a bit about dialect, which creates very particular problems. Now, this is not a problem with Shasha, who does not write in dialect. I know that there was a book produced by a Sicilian professor, whose name I've forgotten. Um, who points out that Shashia's language is more Sicilian than he realised. And that's very possible. But he doesn't use dialect. Unlike his friend 
Vincenzo Consolo, who very definitely does. What can you do with dialect? Well, I follow in this matter D.H. Lawrence, who, as you will no doubt be aware, translated Berger. And he took a very precise line with dialect. He said, dialect is something which belongs to a particular region, to a particular district, that it is geographically as well as linguistically specific. Um, what's the consequence of that belief? Well, what he said was that he was going to translate Berger into the tones, and he used that word, the tones of his native Nottingham in uh, England. That has been followed by some others because Goldoni used dialect, not in all of his plays, and sometimes there are different versions, one in language, one in, um, in, in dialect. Um, Goldoni, but also De Filippo. And there was a magnificent translation of De Filippo's Napoli Milionaria, which was done by the National Theatre in uh, London. Um, they had to leave the title. They decided they could not translate the various implications of the title, Napoli Millionaria. But the man that did it, a man called uh, Peter Tinniswood, who died sadly uh, recently, um, it was picked up by some um, critics as being in the dialect of Liverpool. Now, there is no such thing. And he didn't claim to do that. But he said, that he would use the rhythms, the modalities, um, uh, the tones of his native Liverpool. And that's the problem with dialect. We, frankly, nowadays don't have dialects in the way that Italians do. Um, I know they talk in Scots, happens to be a particular example. I've translated, I've written a biography of Dario Fo, whom I knew quite well. And at one time he asked me to translate Mistero Buffo. But then they asked me to translate it into Scots. I said, yeah, okay, I can do it. And it would be performed in Scotland, maybe in Ireland, maybe in the north of England. But he wanted that translation to be the basic translation which would be used in Toronto, in Chicago, in Melbourne, or in Cape Town, which is just quite simply impossible, impossible. And I explained this to him, and he went into a huff and went away. Um, but I didn't do it in that way. Um, when we're talking about Vincenzo Consolo, I translated Il Sorriso dell'Ignoto Marinaio, and it was a nightmare. It was the most difficult thing I've ever done, partly, partly because he writes very embellished artistic prose as part of a conscious aesthetic decision that the novel is an art form and should not be written in the language of journalism. So he despised Camilleri, also Umberto Eco, by the way, and maybe an element of jealousy when he saw I was in an airport of Umberto Eco's with more restricted um, um, novels of his own. But he used um, Sicilian dialect, once again for very self-conscious reasons. It was a political aesthetic distinction that the language of the uh, margins, if we can regard Sicily that way, should have the same dignity as the, as the language of the capital. You know that there are many debates. What is a dialect? Uh, what is the difference between a dialect and a language? And there's a trite answer often given that a language is a dialect with an, an army and a navy. <laughs> well, not very well, but. It gets a laugh, thank you. <laughs> um, but it doesn't really uh, uh, put us along. So when I was translating Consul, I'm afraid I made the decision that I was not going to try and translate his dialect expressions. He writes in highly embellished prose, mainly in Italian, bits of it in dialect. I was not going to do that. I would do what Lawrence had done, or not to the standard that D.H. Lawrence did, uh, that's to say, I'm afraid I um, ignored the dialect. I translated it all into standard English. I was confirmed in this decision when I read some of the translations made of Camilleri, done by a man called Stefano Sartorelli, who's American, but he lives in Switzerland nowadays. And he's chosen a compromise that seems to me not acceptable. That's to say that he translates the prose into 
standard English or standard American or American English, whatever you wish. Um, but when it comes to the dialogue, where there are passages in dialect, he translated that into a kind of Bronx dialect or Bronx speech. I thought the result was merely grotesque because you have the standard English, um, you had a novel which was set in Sicily, dealing with Sicilian characters, Sicilian reality, and um, Sicilian reality. But suddenly you had these passages of American speech in characters who were going about. But you may, of course, um, disagree uh, with that. Okay, we can come back into discussion, but I don't want to uh, go along. Just one or two um, other things, very interesting. We'll have to talk at some uh, uh, point about the question of accuracy. It seems to me to be fundamentally important, except that you now have some people whom I'll refer to as the translation police, who will go around more or less marking your translation, normally marking you down, identifying deficiency, which of course there are going to be there. If you translate a work of 80,000 or even more than that, in the case <laughs> of Anne, uh, it is there. Yeah, of course, you're going to get some slips. You know, it's going to happen. Um, and any of these people who uh, go on. What have you got to give with Gonzo, sorry, well, with Shasha above all? In particular, a sense of place and a sense of atmosphere. I think it's actually slightly easier with Shasha. I've only translated two works of Shasha, by the way. Il Cavaliere e la Morte and Una Storia Semplice. You got it. Shasha has such intellectual works. We can talk about that in various ways. Um, he writes to be understood. He does not write in the way certain futurist or postmodern writers, especially poets, do, to write in a way not to be understood in the belief that this suggests a certain depth, which is very often not there. So, these are some preliminary considerations which we can then go on to discuss, but I'll stop there and um, uh, listen attentively to my bottle. Why, why don't you go, Anne, and I'll bring it to the ear. Okay. Um, I'm going to start out, if, well, I'm not going to get to Shasha for a minute, but um, <laughs> I wanted to start out talking about Primo Levi, and I just was hearing that it's not totally irrelevant because there have been this, these letters discovered between Shasha and it's Primo Levi. And it seems to be a problem. Oh, oh you may need to pull that close. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That there have been these letters discovered between Shasha and Primo Levi, so it, it's not, I'm not being completely irrelevant here. <laughs> um, Primo Levi was deported to Auschwitz in February of 1944. When, is this okay? Can you hear? Um, one of the first things he realized upon arriving in the concentration camp was how crucial language can be. Even his rudimentary German and his ability to grasp orders that if not followed could lead to death gave him an advantage. And in his first book, If This Is a Man, he uses the image of the Tower of Babel, the inability of men to understand one another and the destruction of language um, to represent one of the ways in which the Nazis destroyed the humanity of their prisoners. At another extreme of language is the child Herbenek of Levy's second book, The Truce, encountered in a makeshift Russian hospital after the collapse of Auschwitz. Herbenek, Levy calls him a nothing, a nothing, a child of death, a child of Auschwitz, has no language, yet is desperate to speak. And Levy writes, his eyes lost in his pinched triangular face flashed terribly alive full of demand of insistence of the will to be released to shatter the tomb of his muteness. The speech that he lacked, that no one had taken care of teaching him, the need for speech persisted in his gaze with explosive urgency. Herbenek dies. In the end, he is able to utter only one incomprehensible sound, and it's only through Levy's words that he speaks, that he exists. These examples may be extreme, but they testify to the existential importance that language can have and by extension to the crucial role of the translator. How to get the text right, how to convey words, meaning, tone, style. In the case of a writer like Levy, with his passion and care for precision and concision, for the right word, the prospect of translation may seem daunting. But these are questions that the translator faces with every author and in any language. 
Like many, or most translators that I know, I began translating almost by accident as a way of studying Italian more closely and intimately from the inside, so to speak. I undertook my first translation as a challenge to myself, as an exercise. The work fascinated and absorbed me, and then the translation was published. Entitled Chekhov in Sondrio, it was a kind of memoir reflection by a little known writer named Aldo Buzzi. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah? Yes. Oh, so interesting. Fantastic. He's amazing. Um, who had trained as an architect and worked for many years in the Italian film industry. So I came to translation by this somewhat informal route, rather than by formal academic study of the literature or through day-to-day -day life in Italy. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit about how I work. Um, probably this will sound familiar to everybody, <laughs> others. Um, when I start a translation, I usually make a fairly rapid first draft. Often at this stage, I put in several alternatives for a word or phrase, but I always leave the literal translation, even if I'm almost certain that I'll change it in the end. I look up words in the dictionary, or rather dictionaries, both in Italian and English, even words I know, because I always find nuances and synonyms that might turn out to be useful when I make a final choice. But at this stage, I don't spend a lot of time or effort refining thoughts or ideas or trying to figure out passages that are tricky or that I have doubts or questions about. I usually make a list of problematic words and expressions. In the second draft, I try to solve most of the bigger problems of meaning and sense, but there will unquestionably be many word choices and refinements still to be made. Although I work on the computer, at a certain point after the second or third draft, say, I print out the manuscript and read it on paper, because you always see things on paper that you might not see on the screen awkward or unintended repetitions, for example, or punctuation tangles, or other sorts of problematic rough spots. I also consult native Italian speakers who don't necessarily agree with each other. Um, I would just add that I, I, since people have been working on computers, I have you know, a translator who actually prints out the manuscript in the, the typeface and the format of the book. So he's, he reads the book, essentially. As a as a way of um, you know seeing what he's done, it's just another another um, another kind of draft. Um, since that first translation, I've translated a wide variety of Italian writers, some famous and some like Buzzi, not well known even to Italians. And this means I've worked on a wide variety of Italian writing, from Pasolini to Alessandro Barrico, from Ferrante to Marina Jar. Um, I have a few samples to read. Should I read them? This is boring. Okay. Uh, this is from Mr. Gwyn by Alessandro Barrico. It's just a few sentences. She went to Jasper Gwyn's studio on the underground, but she always got out one stop earlier to walk a little before going in. On the street, she turned the key over and over in her hand, and that was her way of starting work. And this is from Ragazzi di Vita, um, a, a great dialect problem. <laughs> I'm not reading the dialect problem. <laughs> Needless to say, um, Ricetto paid no attention and ran off over the sun-baked asphalt. All Rome was a single roar. Only up on the hill was there silence, but it was charged like a mine. <laughs> um, and this is from Distant Fathers by Marina Jar, a, a book about her parents. I had many fears. I was a coward, my mother said, in which fears in which people and places got confused. There were people who led me into difficult situations, places that evoked fearful presences. In every place and in every moment, however, I looked for the means, the act, or the word to resolve my fears by myself. Now, I'm going to repeat something that Joe just said. As a translator, the one thing I've always said I would never translate is poetry. It seemed too hard. There were too many choices that would have to be made. Would you focus on sound, on form, on meaning? And then each word carried so much weight, not to mention undertones of culture and history. It seemed to me that you would be very lucky if you captured even a line of the poem. In any text, after all, the writer can choose in his language a single word that includes several meanings, connotations, nuances, degrees, or shades of meaning. The translator, on the other hand, has to choose, in fact, decide which meaning or even which set of nuances is most important. It's unlikely that the language into which you are translating has a single word that contains all the meanings of the word in the original text. 
And in poetry, it always seemed to me that this would be infinitely more difficult. In fact, it's often said that in order to understand a poem in another language, you need several translations. When Renata Sperandio, who was then the director of the Italian Cultural Institute in Dublin, asked if I would translate Shasha's Favole della Dittatura, I had no idea that I would, in fact, be getting into something very close to poetry. As Pasolini says in his essay on the fables, which is included in this book, which I have just a little show and tell, um, what counts is their value as poetry. Many of these fables conclude like short lyrics. And to give the reader an idea of the language, he goes on to compare them to the small images of Alexandrian poetry or Oriental majolica or popular lyric. They are like miniatures, compressed and therefore dense with meaning. Each fable is a succinct, to use Pasolini's word, metaphorical, allegorical meditation commentary on power, in which precisely as in a poem, every word counts. But each is also a narrative. In those few lines, Shasha also tells a story. So I started on my many drafts, many possible meanings for each word. Here's a few examples. Um, indiscreto, tactless, intrusive, indiscreet. Contrizioni, contrition, repentance, remorse. Pieno di sdegno, full of disdain for, contemptuous, scornful. Given that the translator is constantly having to balance the requirements of emphasis and style with the requirements of his own language, in the case of the fables, it seemed to me that these requirements became more exacting and difficult. There was no room to spread out, so to speak. Everything had to be contained. But I always think it's important to stay close to the text, and it was perhaps even more important when there were so few words. The translator is verbally conveying a text from one language to another. She is not, or in my view shouldn't be, trying to create something equivalent. It's like the question of these different, using different English version, like the Bronx accent or something. Um, after the many drafts and the struggle to arrive at the right word, I think it's essential, again, in any translation, to be sure of not having strayed too far and to be sure as well of having understood the meaning not only of the words, but of the entire passage, of the words in their context, of the word in the phrase, in the sentence, in the paragraph. Sometimes you can you think that you found, you after going through many word ideas in your mind and in synonym dictionaries and all over the place, you think you've arrived at the perfect word and then you read the sentence and you realize it just doesn't work at all. So you have to be careful. For example, in the case of Primo Levi, I had to be attentive not to be led astray by the necessary focus on the exactness of particular words. In the case of a writer like Romano Bilenki, whose sentences are almost Jamesian in their complexity and length, I had to be careful to maintain the meaning and as far as possible the style while creating an English structure. In the novels of Elena Ferrante, it can be hard to preserve the intensity of emotion created by the rush of words within an English syntax and without losing the meaning. In the case of Shasha's, whoops, where's my other page? Ah, sorry. In the case of Shasha's fables, I had to try not to lose the lightness and delicacy and surface simplicity and straightforwardness of the Italian, along with the concision of the narrative. And I had to pay attention not only to the words meaning in the sentence, but to its place, its physical or sonic relationship to other words. Here's a sentence from the fifth fable. Ma lusinuolo per tutta la notte tacque di paura. The literal translation. But the nightingale all night was silent out of fear. A second version. But the nightingale, fearful, was silent all night. Here I move the adverbial phrase all night to a position that is more natural in English. I also wanted to separate nightingale and night, an awkward repetition that doesn't exist in Italian. I considered that all I considered that all night the nightingale would also be possible in English, but perhaps would sound a little like a ditty. I wanted to avoid the two-word preposition out of as adding clutter to the sentence. So I changed out of fear to fearful, which I also thought created a strong ending with silent all night. But then the commas required by fearful seemed to create too many pauses, and the word, the word fearful seemed less connected to the verb. Italian, of course, has the advantage of tacere, in, or in this case, taque, a verb that in English doesn't exist and has to be expressed by two words as an adjective with the verb to be. With these two issues in mind, I came up with the third version. 
but the nightingale was silenced all night by fear. It's true that was silenced is like was silent, a two word phrase, but it has more of a quality of a verb and it meant that the awkward out of could become by. The whole phrase seemed more active and also closer to the Italian in meaning if not precisely in form. These decisions and interpretations are in some ways arbitrary. Certainly another translator would have had different ideas, different ways of thinking about a sentence, made different choices. I myself, reading the fables again after nearly a year, find sentences that I might do differently now. But one of the risks of translation is that you can always be second guessed, especially by yourself. My hope is to have demonstrated what Levy called linguistic sensibility and that the margin for second guessing is minimal. Or if like Pasolini, we think of the fables as poems, perhaps we need a few more translations of them. And I'll just add one little thing, which is my, one of the, the um, metaphors for a translator that I've always found really um, compelling is from an essay on translation by the critic Cesare Garboli. To translate is to be an actor, the same attitude, the same condition of the spirit that leads us institutionally to perform, to create theater, to physically breathe the life of another. The translator begins to put on his makeup. He can, as is permitted in the theater, do everything. He can play, mock, disguise himself. He is alone, he is free, and here he is on stage. He has chosen to create, invent, bring into existence a thing that is already there, already exists, has already been written, to make it exist as it was written, and as no one ever imagined it before him, the one who is performing it. So maybe there should be some more actors performing the fables. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, I feel like a shiftless reprobate for not showing up here with some written remarks. Oh. But uh, I do have some things I'd like to say. Um, first of all, though, I'd like to recur just a bit. Oh, well, both of you talked about the the perils of dialect and what to do with it. Um, in my translation of Shasha, which is this book, Sicily's Metaphor, there's no dialect in it at all. So I was not remotely faced with this problem. But in another book I translated, which was uh, the novel Inshallah by Oriana Falaci, uh, there was very much of, of a problem with it because the book, which was an immense war novel about uh, the Italian contingent in Beirut, of uh, featured soldiers from all over the Italian peninsula, and each of them spoke in their own dialect. However, uh, Oriana then translated that dialect into standard English, I'm sorry, into standard Italian for the Italian reader, and I felt that I was immediately given an out to drop all the <laughs> dialect and just translate the Italian. Um, of course, there are translators who have recurred to this well, this is a rural Italian, so it will be someone from Alabama, and this is a, a urban Italian, it will be from the South Bronx. I don't find those solutions uh, feasible at all, partly because those modes of speaking, those dialects are tethered to a particular culture. And when you simply reattach them to someone from Calabria or someone from Milan, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense anymore. So I just drop that. Um, as it turned out, that book, which was very long, was very hard to translate for reasons not having to do with the dialect. It was uh, really as if the mouth of hell had opened up and I fell in for six to eight months. That had more to do with the personality of the author than um, the book itself, not to speak ill of the dead. Um, so anyway, I wanted to just put in the, the, that brief uh, remark about dialect. Um, as for Shasha, um, this book, Sicily is Metaphor, this is apparently one of the three copies left on the face of the earth. <laughs> They're very hard to track down. I should be keeping it in a vault, clearly, in my house. But um, um, this book is, in a way, a slightly different beast, a slightly different animal from uh, the works that these two people translated, because uh, this is essentially Shasha talking. Uh, they were interviews done by a journalist by the name of Marcel Palavani, and um, there are very few questions and many answers in here, which is to say that she essentially took a series of interviews with Shasha and made it all him speaking. It's a series of monologues almost. Because he's an extraordinarily good talker and because I think she probably did a good job uh, pruning and shaping a little bit, um, it's extraordinarily, art uh, stra extraordinarily articulate and uh, often very funny and very beautiful. And it's clear to me the ways in which 
Shasha the talker overlaps with Shasha the writer. There's a similar directness and wit and irony, and uh, I find all those things very attractive and in both the speaker and, and in the um, writer. As it happens in this book, he is asked about his writerly procedure, and he says to uh, Padovani, well, uh, I write all my books during the summer in Rakamutu. Uh, I, when I have an idea, I spend the entire rest of the year gathering information, going to the archives, interviewing people, mulling it over, and then I go away in the summer and I write it down. He said he wrote, I think, three to five hours a day and that he hardly ever did any rewriting, which I found fascinating. In fact, in this book, he says that Jufa is one of the very few stories he wrote that he ever extensively rewrote afterwards. And that, in a way, to me, does clarify some relationship between how he spoke and how he wrote. I'm not saying his, his work is very literary. It's very considered. It's not blurted out in any way. But I think um, there's a convergence between probably the way he thought and spoke and wrote. Um, anyway, this book came out in um, first French and then Italian in 1979. The interviews were conducted in the last few years of the 1970s. Uh, I was shocked when I picked up this book yesterday to see that I uh, translated it in 1993. <laughs> it came out in 1994, which is to say almost 30 years ago. Um, I did not think I was quite that much of an anciano, but it turns out <laughs> I am. So um, it's nearly a 30-year-old translation. And I, although I've dipped into it over the years, I had not read it cover to cover since then. So I picked it up yesterday, and I read the whole thing. It's not that long a book. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. I was actually a little bit on edge because when you pick up something you, you worked on 30 years ago, that can be a very perilous <laughs> undertaking for a writer or a translator. It was the second book I'd ever done, and I think I was still learning as a translator. Um, I was pleased to see it wasn't a total train wreck and that most of it really reads pretty well. I can see areas, not really areas, specific moments where uh, I was unsure how to phrase it. Or sometimes I can see where I fell into the trap of a false cognate and didn't quite get it right. Um, the other thing is that this, bo this book, these conversations from the late 70s, presuppose a certain amount of knowledge about Italian politics of that era. Um, and I schooled myself as I went along, and I think I did reasonably well. But um, you know, I can see moments where I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the right thing to say. But generally, it, I think it reads OK, and I don't feel so terrible. Um, but it, it, did, it did make me think um, about some of the sources of Shasha's style and how to characterize it and some of the difficulties in translating it. And I think uh, in a related issue, some of the reasons why it has been hard for Shasha to find an American audience commensurate with his greatness as a writer. Um, there have been several waves of translation of Shasha into English. One of them was done at Karkinet, the British publisher of uh, Knopf did a bunch of these in the United States, and then more recently, uh, New York Review Classics has now redone them again. I, I don't think those are new translations. They all have a new introduction. Um, and I think Shasha, though, he is, to me, undeniably a great, not just Italian writer, but a great European writer of the 20th century, um, has found it hard to get a toehold in the United States and to get a large readership. Um, and I'd like to just say a, a few things uh, about his style, some of them having to do with the things he says in the book, some of them having to do with my experience translating him, and then um, speculate just a bit on some of the obstacles for a mass American audience. Um, Shasha stresses in this book that, um, to some extent, that the roots of his style are not really uh, Sicilian or Italian. He loved, um, he loved the French, uh, French writers of the Enlightenment. He loved Diderot. He loved Voltaire, and he, he comes back to these figures again and again in this book as, uh, in a way, the taproot of his own style. And I think that makes sense in a way. I'm just going to read you one sentence that he has to say about Voltaire, and I think you will immediately recognize. Um, he says, I believe that Voltaire uh, reposes right in the line if such a thing exists where writers aim at finishing. He's the very example of literary professionalism, a model writer. Clear, swift, concise, precise, intelligent, economical, ironic. That's Voltaire, everything that for me represents the key to writing and true craft. Now, 
that to me is very much a self-portraiture uh, in terms of his own style. Um, now, he loved many uh, Italian and Sicilian writers. In this book, he mentions that Manzoni is probably almost his favorite Italian writer. He loved Pirandello, he loved Brancati. I mean, he's by no means divorced from Italian and more specifically Sicilian literature, but um, it fascinated me to be reminded of his own sense of connection to this other uh, continental and specifically French tradition. He certainly recoils at the more uh, florid tributary of Italian prose. I mean, D you know, Denuncio is not for him. He hates extra embellishment. Um, he, he, he hates floridness, floweriness, anything that is a, a way of evading the truthfulness of what he's writing about. And so it was great to be reminded of that. Um, now, as I was translating this book, um, at a surface level, I would say, um, Shasha is not so hard to translate, even for someone who, like myself, was pretty close to the beginning of my translating career because, again, his Italian is direct, clear, economical, concise, all of these things. Um, I think the part that is very hard for an American translator to convey and very hard for an American audience to absorb uh, is that elusive uh, voice of his, the elusive tone of his. Um, because while the prose is often very straightforward, there is always a sense of history, uh, cultural and historical context lingering in the background. He's, a, he's an elusive writer, but in a very, um, sometimes an elusive writer in an elusive way. Um, I also think that there is a kind of irony all the time in the background. Um, not a cheapening irony, not an irony at the necessarily expense of his characters, but a enriching irony that is often sadly or you know joyously winking at the the corruption of the of the whole society encasing what he's writing about um i think those are very hard things to get in this is all a tonal thing you know it's not a matter of well there's the word i'll translate it but there's a very elusive sort of tone in him and i also think that that may be a barrier in some ways to his american readership i think to make things very simple. I mean, Americans are used to a certain kind of bucolic or rustic Italian writing that is about the jolly peasantry and, you know, coming sort of out of Boccaccio. Everyone is cheating on each other and there's a, there's a lot of lovable lowlifes and things like that. Um, I suppose there's a certain portion of the American public that welcomes uh, the playfulness of a writer like Calvino, you know, a postmodernist, lipo loving writer like Calvino. Um, Shasha doesn't really fit into either of those schools, in my opinion. He can be quite funny. There's a dry humor all the time, but I don't think he fits into either of those schools. The other thing is he is a writer uh, with such an acute awareness of history in everything he writes, Sicilian history, European history. Um, I think all of the phases of, of uh, Sicilian history are uh, alive and present to him when he's writing, which is why he can take a 500-year-old nugget of Sicilian history and make it seem absolutely contemporary, and vice versa. Um, Americans are famously not interested in history, and I don't just mean Sicilian history, I mean their own history. Uh, this has been clear um, since de Tocqueville came to America and famously remarked, you know, that Americans, what was amazing about America was it's the, the capacity to reinvent yourself. That identity was so fungible, you could pick up, uh, you could turn yourself into another person. Your ancestry and your history were ballast to be thrown overboard if you liked. Um, he saw a peril in this. He said that all Americans risk being confined in the isolation of their own hearts. But I think we are a country that tends to be allergic to the idea that, that history is not only the background, but is a kind of fate or necessity, and that it controls your behavior in ways you might not like. Um, so I, I think there's a slight allergy to a writer like Shasha for whom history is operating in every moment of everybody's lives. Um, I also think that um, even Shasha's love of what should be a popular form like the detective story, which you would then think, well, wouldn't that enamor him to Americans? You know, we love a, we love a good detective story. We love, you know, Raymond Chandler and you know, a gigantic tradition like that. Um, but as other people have pointed out today, um, Shasha's detective stories don't end up where the detective stories are supposed to end up. Um, 
it's more likely the case that everyone in town knows who committed the murder, but no one will say that person's name. And the person who may have been most curious and most close to solving it, it usually ends up as a cadaver in a sulfur mine or something like that. So um, he doesn't do with these popular forms what American readers want him to do. Um, I'm not trying to totally typecast the American audience as you know, sort of blithering, history allergic nitwits. They're not like that at all. But I think in all these ways, Sasha, uh, Sasha just has not fit easily into the ecosystem of American readership. Um, I hope that we could improve that situation because I think he's a magnificent writer. He has, he has uh, a lot to say to American readers as well as European readers. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm basically going to end on that note. But even to say that when I reread this book yesterday, I was reminded that um, this was the uh, probably 76, 77, 78, something like that, when, when Padovani was doing these interviews with, with Shasha. And um, as I'm sure many of you know, um, Shasha had his own rapprochement with the Italian Communist Party, and he ran for the Palermo City Council, I think, in 1975 or something like that. And uh, it's, uh, what, it's 75, OK. He served on it for one year. He talks about it in this book. And he just said he was so disillusioned by its utter inefficacy and inability to do anything. The, the council uh, would meet at 9 PM. That's when they convened. And he said it was not till midnight that we could even start thinking about doing business. And that's something as simple as the fact that large portions of Palermo had no water or sewage connection, could never, ever be addressed, whatever happened. He was so disillusioned, he, 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 he tendered his resignation after a year. But there's a whole long conversation in this book, which has everything to do with the Ani di Piombo and also the Italian Communist Party and the historic compromise. And um, those things are utterly meaningless to an American readership. I mean, the, 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 I, again, I'm not trying to impugn terrible Americans. I mean, I, but um, even in translating a book like this, I just remember feeling like, how much of this should I try to explain? Should I put in a footnote? Should there be an additional introduction? Um, should I, sometimes you can simply shoehorn into the text itself, treading as lightly as you can on the author's toes, some a bit of explanatory text, but. Um, Shasha is just deeply embedded in these things. He, I think he's a universal writer and a very, very specific writer. And in that same way, he felt that Sicily was a, a very isolated, sui generis place unto itself, and that it was a universal place. And in fact, he felt that not, not only Italy, but that all of Europe was becoming increasingly Sicilianized. And he says several times in this book, he, he refers to the northward creep of the palm tree line which was advancing a certain amount every year, which now seems like a very early uh, nod to actually uh, climate change. But then he saw that as a metaphysical change as well, that the Sicilianness of Sicily was gradually engulfing the, the continent, as he called Italy, and then the entire world. So um, I guess I'll stop my rambling right there. And I'm very curious to hear any responses from the audience or from either of you two. But, um, yeah, reimmersing myself in this really made me think a lot about Shasha, his language, his audience there and here. And uh, I, I hope some of that was of interest anyway. Um, just a quick comment on the presentations. I found myself going back and forth um, with Mr. Farrell. The, the two words that came into my head, you spoke a lot about dialect, but accent and dialect was what I was differentiating in my mind. And maybe you can comment on how you look at the differences between, you mentioned the Liverpool, which I guess like a Scouse accent, but is that, how does that differ from dialect? So that's the first thought I had there. And um, Ms. Goldstein, just with the translator, I wonder if interpreter also comes into that as I, I, it made me think about what your role really is. I never thought about it that way. 
So context, and you're really interpreting um, more. I just made me think about that. And lastly, sorry, the, if you could please comment on the elusive idea and why you describe um, Leonardo Shasha in that way. I, I find it also, but I can't explain it. Maybe. Thank you. Well, in regard to your question about Liverpool, about uh, Di Filippo, Napoli, Millionaria, the basic thing is that the vocabulary is basic the basically the same. In an Italian dialect, then you would have a completely different register. You would have a different vocabulary, not universally, obviously, but in general, it would be there. That's not the case um, with, well, for example, in this one uh, in Liverpool. It is a question of accent. If you like, it's a question of tone. It's a question of the musicality. Scots is actually a wee bit different because, I mean, Scots was once, <clears throat> um, if you read the novels of Walter Scott, Robert Louis Stevenson, the poetry of Robert Burns, it was a separate language. So there are certain words which do um, continue in Scots speak, speech, which is not necessarily uh, understood or comprehensible um, in different places. And I think possibly that is the essential difference that a dialect, a dialect will have a different uh, vocabulary due to a different history. Um, and it's one of the things of Italy, if you, I, I don't have a command of any dialect, but I worked with Goldoni, uh, Venetian, and also with De Filippo. So in Naples, then the dialect is influenced very strongly by the Spanish, because the Spaniards were there for such a long time. Um, Venice, similarly, there were then different historical influences, and above all, there was a the very deep uh, sense of Venetian independence when Venice was once one of the great powers of Europe uh, and of the, Med the Mediterranean. Um, I don't think you find that in English. I would speak with less confidence about the American situation, but I think basically the same thing applies that um, a dialect is basically a lesser language, I don't mean morally lesser, um, uh, but it has then a range of expressions based on a historical experience, which is not the case when you have uh, more uniformity and differentiation of accent or maybe a turn of phrase. For example, I could be, as I said, that's, Mr. Sartorelli, whom I mentioned disparagingly, he's obviously very confident of that. Um, yes, the translator is, I mean, you're interpreting not like, not in the sense of a person doing simultaneous interpretation, but in the sense, obviously, of thinking about what something means and interpreting, you know, the way you would interpret, I mean, deciding, as I said, what, what did he, yeah, what's, what did, what did the writer mean? Can I just make one slight addition? Um, there was a man, Sergio Romano, who's uh, referred to as Ambasciatore Romano. He was the Italian ambassador in Moscow, and when he retired from that, he uh, wrote some books, one of which was a very good history. It was despised by professional historians, but it seemed to me very good. A history of Italy from the Risorgimento. And he asked the question, what is it that makes a nation? And he said that normally you have three factors, three factors, a common history, a common religion, and a common language. Well, these three, he said, Italy only had one. It's a common religion. Of course, there's a Jewish presence in some places, and of course, um, there was also um, the uh, Waldensians who then became, who predated the Reformation. But essentially, Italy did not have a common history and did not have a common language. And I think it is that that makes Italy different from other countries. In the European Union, there are more languages, first of all, French spoken over in the Val d'Aosta, um, Albanian, which is spoken, though to a decreasing extent, in some villages in uh, Calabria and also in uh, Sicily. The German in the Alto Adige, South Tyrol, is maybe a different kind of consideration, although it was part of a drive 
to have an Italy which would go up um, to the Alps. But there was no common history and there was no common language. Uh, if these, if you agree that these are the three central notions which traditionally, historically, constituted a nation. Thank you very much for your beautiful presentation. Uh, myself, I am translator, so I entirely <laughs> feel myself in hell when I am translating to Italian. <laughs> but from Arabic, that means it's not that easy. But I wanted to ask you something. I'm sorry I'm not uh, specialized in American history, therefore I might be saying something stupid. But uh, I was thinking about Shasha, the Council of Egypt. So the Council of Egypt was a book conceived uh, with a large knowledge about Sicilian history, the period, the fact that it was relating to a real ambassador who had visited Palermo, and so uh, the, 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 the characters, they were true people. But in a way, he used it as a metaphor to speak about the mentality of the Sicilian elite in his time. So the need to place a, a story in history is a device at times to escape from censorship, which is a problem America doesn't really have. I mean, so also the fact that they're not much interested in history because uh, it, it is a young, country, yeah, more or less. So it could be possible that uh, the American public, I entirely agree with you, you have to think about the people you address in your speech, your writings, uh, they could be more fascinated by um, Shasha, the mystery more than history, like Todomodo, for instance, because for mystery, they love mystery, yeah, the no, Americans. They, they yeah. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, you're quite right that that Shasha often will use quite a lot of actual historical material from many many eras of Sicilian history. Um, he talks a bit in here about his book about uh, the disappearance of Majorana, uh, who was a the, the, you know a Sicilian physicist, very brilliant, who uh, Shasha feels was really probably on the verge of discovering nuclear weapons and nuclear fusion, and because he found that morally abhorrent he engineered his own disappearance and has never, ever been heard from. And we don't know what happened to him. I, I don't think Americans would be incapable of grasping why that is interesting. And also the fact that Majorana's self-imposed silence has an interesting relationship to the role of other kinds of more ominous silence in uh, Sicilian culture. Um, I, I just wanted to say two other things that, you know, I would well like to add to the, the, the role playing of the trans, translator that we've talked about, the uh, polygamist. I think the polygamist is also a good uh, comparison. You, you have a great loyalty to two different beloved languages. You will probably satisfy neither of them in the course of your work. But um, it was, um, I, I, if I can beg your indulgence for a minute, there were two tiny passages from this book I, I did want to share with you. Um, Shash is at every moment in this book delivering an anatomy of himself and delivering an anatomy of Sicily. And th these things are so tied together. Um, even the ways he hates Sicily, he loves the place, and he sees them reflected in himself. Um, there was one passage where he's being asked by the interviewer about the question of, do you write for yourself or do you write for others? And I just wanted to share his answer. Or, In other words, she says, why would it be more, more, more moral to write for yourself? He says, because one cannot trifle with oneself, because every one of us takes himself so seriously and feels regarding himself such respect that that constitutes the best of all possible commitments in favor of honesty. And finally, to write for yourself is a guarantee that you won't make the reader waste his time. In short, and to return to my own case, let's just say that I write about myself, for myself, and sometimes against myself. The third of these things is very important to him, I think. He, uh, part of the sort of terrible and fascinating honesty of his work is that he is, the indictment is often against himself in some way. Um, he, he sees himself complicit in all of the marvelous and terrible things about Sicily. Um, now in a lighter vein, but in a related one, um, 
he's talking at one point about the roles of female and male in Sicilian culture. He, he argues that women have been pushed into some very toxic roles by the culture itself, and that the men, the flip side of the same coin, have also been you know, molded into some very bad behavioral patterns. Um, and he is talking about the Sicilian variety of um, macho-ness, and specifically as it pertains to sex. Um, and he says, it's obvious then why with the Sicilian, meaning the Sicilian male, the sexual act often reduces itself to not very much at all. In any case, practice without a great deal of pleasure, an act fleeting or even painful in its tragic brevity, and how sexuality, never being enjoyed as such, belongs to the world of the unreal. At the University of Heidelberg, they conducted studies of couples made up of Sicilian men and German women. The researchers discovered that even in Heidelberg, the Sicilians continue to be convinced of their indomitable sexual superiority and their unbeatable rapidity, although the German women found no cause for contentment in performances so incomparably swift. Um, I'm sorry, it just made me laugh when I read it yesterday. But I think even there, I mean, he's having some fun. I mean, that is a, that's a joke, really. But he's also pointing to something self-hobbling, at least in his generation of Italian men. And, you know, I can't speak for the Sicilian men of today, but I found this an absolutely hilarious uh, indictment and probably a self-indictment as well. So I, I jump, thank you for letting me share those passages. I just love them. Yeah, I like to um, to share with you the experience we have with our journal of Shasha Studies Todomodo, where we have a section devoted to translations, and um, we found out uh, that Shasha established with these translators a um, correspondence. It is not unusual that he asks, he writes, to um, he receives letters where. The translator has to clarify, for example, how to, to manage these uh, categories of uh, uh, men in, in Sicily, of the uomini, mezzi uomini, qua qua qua. And um, the last one was uh, on, on uh, translation in Finnish. Now, um, the reason why I mention this is because I like to know, in your experience with other authors, whether it's normal to have this dialogue between the translators and authors. Because in the case of Shasha, we were impressed to see how uh, he was uh, responding um, with um, providing support, providing indication, insights. So he was always collaborative. And uh, I wonder whether this is uh, common in other, for other authors that you had translated in your life. Thank you. Sometimes, but I actually translated a lot of dead authors. So, um, yes, and many translators prefer that. <laughs> because, I know, well, in fact, going back to Aldo Buzzi, he was, he was wonderful, but he was also constantly um, criticizing the translation. Plus, he was always rewriting. So <laughs> it was kind of an impossible combination. So it was, often the writer will think that he or she knows better, you know, more English than he or she does know. And that's difficult. But, but many writer, with many writers, it's collaboration is great. I mean, it's, it's great to have someone who can, when you're trying to interpret what do you mean by this, to have someone who can tell you what he means is, um, is really a, a gift. Oh, we only have one left. <laughs> um, I have my own categorization. I have three, three categories of author I've worked with. An author who is dead, which is the most desirable situation, frankly. An author who knows English well and with whom you can have a proper discussion. Daniele Del Giudice was not. Your disaster is when you have an author who doesn't speak English well, but thinks they do. Thinks they do. Then you actually have a really uh, incredibly difficult situation. I don't want to give you, I had a brief, well, I met Shasha a couple of times. I was not one of his close friends, of whom Sicily is now full, but I met him a couple of times, and he was quite happy for me to be uh, translating the two works that I did and said he would help. But I did write to him with one question. <clears throat> 
I actually received a very brief answer, which I'm afraid I've lost. I'll try to find it. He said, okay, Joe, he didn't call me Joe, but anyway, that was the idea. I don't speak any English, which he didn't. Basically, you get on with it. If there is a Sicilian point, get back to me, um, and we'll see what we can do. Well, in fact, in the two books that I was doing, there weren't. So that didn't come to very much. With others, you can have a... Um, I mean, it does really vary. As I say, the Neely del Judici, I translated only one of his novels. He spoke good English, and I went to meet him in the house in Venice. And to my dismay, he had page by page of my manuscript with notes in the margin and underlinings and question marks, and then most dismayingly, exclamation marks. Um, and in particular, I had, this comes back to what James was saying, I had as an introduction to a chapter um, which was about, the, the book was about flight, um, about that disaster, sorry in my mind, the, the Italian plane which crashed into the sea, possibly en route to Libya, and there was then, <coughs> they had intercepted uh, some messages and so on. And I thought an English-speaking audience would know nothing about it, so I wrote, I thought, a brief but factual introduction saying this was about. He didn't want it. He didn't want it. Um, and we had a long discussion, and eventually it was reduced to a couple of sentences, which gave the most salient features. By the way, that chapter then became a kind of musical oratorio. It was very beautifully written um, in English and Italian. I forget who the musician was. You can then go on to talk about some... I translated Dario Faw. I got on very well. I knew Dario well. I've written a biography of him. But he wasn't interested. He had absolutely zero interest in what uh, people could do. His wife, Frank Arami, was different. I liked Franca a lot, and she would certainly uh, set aside the time. I mean, I remember one dismaying, uh, I was translating one of his works, and I said, I have a couple of questions I want to ask. Um, it was a prose work, um, uh, not one of his plays. And I asked the first question, and I got up and said, Adesso ti accompagno alla censura. I didn't want to be a company to the lift. I, I had a whole, or, or elevator, as you say here. Um, I had a whole variety of questions. He basically, very politely, kissed me in both cheeks, but then pushed me into the lift, and that was the end of it. I then told Frank about this, and she apparently berated Dario over this bad manners and so on, and she helped me through with whatever the problem there was. There was the, the last... Um, there was a book eventually I did not translate by a woman called um, Simona Agnello Hornby. The book was a novel called La Menulara. And frankly, I didn't get on with her at all. I signed um, a contract with the publisher and started, and I'd done a fair bit of work. I, I don't work the same way as Anne. I do write notes all over the book, actually, rather than preparing a complete first draft. Um, so I, I get on with this, and she phoned up. She She's Italian, but she has lived and worked most of her life in London as um, an advocate in children's cases. So she does speak very good English, I have to say. And she said, when was I going down to London? And I said, well, I haven't done a full chapter yet. I will send it to you chapter by chapter. What she wanted was me to drop everything and go down and live in her house in London for whatever time it took to do the, the translation. I said, well, you know, I've got a job in the university. I simply can't spend that amount of time. Well, then the thing came to nothing because, incredibly, it turned out that although the publisher had actually signed a contract with me as translator, they had not signed a contract with the writer, so they didn't actually have a legal claim on the rights. So the whole thing ended up rather badly. The book was published by Penguin, and I did meet... They came to the Edinburgh, where well, she came, and as did her publisher, um, as did her translator to the Edinburgh Book Festival. And I spoke to him and said, how do you go on? He said, absolute hell. <laughs> <laughs> Never again, he said. So these things obviously vary, in my experience, from writer to writer. Uh, yeah, if I could just add one or two notes to that. I mean, I've, I've already mentioned the Falacci affair, and I'm not going to say a lot more about it. But actually, that was the nightmare situation that Joe was talking about, where you have a writer who has a decent command of, of everyday spoken English, but is in no condition to translate what she had written as a very high literary work in some ways. And 
Uh, I did I, I did an initial run through of this book, which is about a thousand manuscript pages. There was then a very ominous silence from the publisher, and then I was told, "No, Oriana is rewriting your entire translation in English, and she would like to have your name taken off and be given the credit as the translator." Um, an older, wiser version of me would probably now say, "Give me ten thousand dollars, and I'll just walk away." But I was so angry at the many months I'd put into this that I found a lawyer. Uh, and some nasty litigious behavior went on and on and on. And I got a look at some of the truly terrible rewriting she had done, much of which was cleaned up by a copy editor. And weirdly, when that book came out, it said, translated by Oriana Falacci from a translation by James Marcus, which is a very weird formulation that I've never seen on any other book. Um, but she, I mean, she shot herself in the foot effectively because particularly in the dialogue of the book, it was very awkward and very non-colloquial, and they, the reviews noted this invariably. Um, I'd, several of the authors I've worked with are dead, Casanova being a great example. He was not around to interfere in any way. But uh, I will say that um, I did a book of, of Goffredo Parise's called uh, The Syllabario in, in uh, Italian, and I was, I, before I actually had a contract for the book, I did a couple of these little short, very touching pieces and I was uh, given his address to write to him, to, sh to show him my work, to send him the, the English, and you know, give, have him uh, give me permission to proceed. And um, he presumably looked at them, but the only, he didn't, he had no, no advice to offer, no, he just wrote on the, one of the pieces, go to the New Yorker and ask for un sacco di soldi. That was, that was the entirety of his advice. And so that was the kind of non-interference I was also looking for um, short of being dead, that was just about perfect. But, but obviously, it's wonderful to have a writer there who can uh, help you with a dead end or something like that. I've tended more to turn to other Italian-speaking friends and send them the things that I could not possibly unravel. And usually, that uh, did the case. Uh, occasionally, again, sometimes your Italian friends don't know what this thing is. Um, and I will say that I was chatting recently with two, two Italian friends I had corresponded with, but I had never met them. And when they showed up, I said, I think we better speak in English, because I think your English is, is way better than my Italian. So that's what we did. But at a couple of points, I tried to interject, just for local color, some Italian idioms that I was familiar with. And one of them was al paso di lumaca, at a snail's pace. And when I said that, they just looked puzzled. And one of them said to me, nobody since Boccaccio has used that idiom. <laughs> so so uh, clearly my Italian needs some sprucing up and contemporary, contemporary ising somehow. But that's a whole other, that's a whole other problem. So anyway. I can just add on a very, very brief this is what, note. <clears throat> that time when Aniello Hornby came to the Edinburgh Book Festival, she was obviously up on the stage uh, together with Tim Parks, if I remember. And there was a guy at the back of the tent kicking his heels in evident frustration. And I knew he was the translator. <laughs> so I went up to him and said, are you, I can't remember his name. I, I said, yes, how did you know him? We met before. No, 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 I said. But I recognize the attitude that you're taking up uh, into this. You're totally shut out from it now, having spent a year, and maybe even more, in the company of this bloody awful woman, frankly. Um, and now you're not being given any credit for it. Anyway. So thank you very much for sharing with us the problematic situation of translation. Thank you very much. Uh, and now actually from translation, we pass to adaptation, so cinematographic adaptation of Shasha's novels. And we start this session, they will see Gaetana, Marrone Puglia, Antonio Munda talking about the cinema. And we want to start uh, sharing with you a very important unreleased interview to Shash and Fellini made by Rita Cirio in around 1983. That is in Italian, obviously, but we subtitled it, so we translate it. And that's a very important document and very original since it's the first time that it's been shown. So if we can please turn off some lights here, probably, just to let them see better. Mm -hmm. 
Is it just a really sort of fast before all this goes on? Yeah, it is. Leonardo, tu trai una tua ragione di essere scrittore nel dare voce a una realtà collettiva, sociale, mentre Fellini dà voce all'inconscio collettivo e soprattutto individuale. Mi piacerebbe che vi confrontaste su questo tema e soprattutto, insomma, perché scrivete o filmate? A chi vi rivolgete? Esiste un vostro spettatore o lettore ideale? No, io non credo che si scriva o si faccia un film o un quadro, non so, pensando a un tipo di, di fruitore, a, a un pubblico, a un lettore, a uno spettatore. No, io credo che si scriva proprio per altri se stessi, ecco, pensando che ci sia della gente che si diverte o si interesserà come noi ci si diverte a scrivere o a fare un film. Uso la parola divertimento, si capisce, tra, tra virgolette, ma comunque io sono del parere che se uno non si diverte a fare un film o a scrivere un libro, non si divertiranno nemmeno i lettori, sarà un libro noioso, un film noioso e anche inutile. Perché scrivete o filmate? Vi rivolgete a un interlocutore privilegiato in particolare oppure lavorate solo per voi stessi e l'interlocutore è una fase che viene dopo? Ma io non credo che sia possibile fare tanta chiarezza sul, sul motivo vero che muove questa... questa molla o, o, o fa realizzare questo tipo di, di vocazione, di chiamata, chiamala come vuoi tu. Quando mi domando, ma quando sento parlare con tanta sicurezza da colleghi, ma soprattutto dei produttori del pubblico, eh, certamente immagino che chi scrive o chi dipinge o chi suona a livelli profondi sa che quello che fa è un modo di comunicare con gli altri, ha a che fare con un, con un messaggio che vuoi trasmettere, però non penso che ci si preoccupi consapevolmente di quello che verrà a vedere il tuo film o che leggerà il tuo libro, cercando di compiacerlo, di spaventarlo, comunque di interessarlo. Non credo che questo sia razionalizzabile, che sia programmabile. Penso che chi crede di avere questa vocazione o chi crede che il suo lavoro, il suo, la sua vita sia quella di dover raccontare a un altro una storia o di mostrare all'altro un quadro o di far ascoltare all'altro della musica o di far leggere le sue pagine, di fondo, nel profondo, sa che deve farlo nei termini che il, quello che vuol dire sia recepibile, sia, sia capito e quindi distinto sa che c'è qualcuno che deve ascoltarlo, però non si preoccuperà mai, credo che non sia possibile preoccuparsi di sapere esattamente che cosa, come l'altro desidera ascoltare quello che tu vuoi dire. Eh, senti, torniamo un attimo al film di Fellini, all'ultimo film, La nave va. Lì la prima guerra mondiale scoppia quasi per caso, se ti ricordi un gesto individuale che scatena la reazione della nave austriaca. Oggi i cannoni che ci sono nel film sono diventati missili e proprio nella tua Sicilia, eh, la tua Sicilia è coinvolta direttamente con la base missilistica di Comiso. Che cosa vuol dire per un siciliano avere i missili in giardino? 
Beh, come siciliano sono indignato perché proprio si sceglie la Sicilia come una pattumiera, ci sono i missili da scaricare e li scarichiamo in Sicilia, questo mi indigna. Come, come cittadino dico che non si può fare un discorso di pace a metà, cioè non si può dire noi stiamo nella Nato e non vogliamo i missili, si deve dire noi non vogliamo stare in nessuna alleanza militare. Ecco, io trovo che il discorso più grande sulla pace è quello fatto da Montaigne, quando dice c'è la guerra civile, intorno si ammazzano, eccetera, io me ne sto con la porta aperta. La mia sicurezza è la porta aperta. Ecco, così penso che si debba fare un discorso di pace. Aprendo la porta. Quasi tutti i tuoi libri sono stati trasformati in uh, testi teatrali o in film. Di alcune riduzioni teatrali tu hai detto qualunque cosa. Non sei rimasto soddisfatto, hai avuto anche polemiche con i registi, mi pare. E, mentre per il teatro tu stesso hai scritto direttamente, non mi risulta che tu abbia avuto la tentazione mai di scrivere una sceneggiatura per il cinema. Cosa vuol dire? Che il mezzo cinematografico non ti interessa proprio? No, mi interessa, ma io vorrei che non si facessero film da testi letterari già, già consacrati, diciamo, ecco. No, no, io lascio fare molto, molto liberamente, perché il libro sta lì, dopo tutto. Lo si può controllare Lo si anche può, dopo sì. Eh, ne sono scontento, in linea di massima, di quello che hanno fatto i registi cinematografici, e anche eh, dichiara che ha quasi ridotto tutti i miei racconti per, eh, per il teatro. Ecco, c'è stato un momento in cui avrei scritto per il teatro e però la presenza del regista mi ha paralizzato. Forse dovresti fare tu stesso il regista. Eh, no, non me la sento, insomma. Io ho proposto questo grosso premio Pirandello di cui faccio parte nella giuria, io ho proposto di cambiarlo e di darlo a chi ci porta la testa di un regista. E in quanto alle sceneggiature cinematografiche ne ho fatta una sola, perché partiva proprio da, dai documenti del film Bronte di, di Florestano Vancini. Poi ho detto a tutti che bisogna fare un film comico su Garibaldi oppure un film sui sotterranei del Vaticano di Gid, ma nessuno mi ha dato mai ascolto. Però i sotterranei del Vaticano fatti non eh, eh, con fedeltà al libro, no? spostandolo al pontificato di Paolo VI o al pontificato di questo. Di Papa Voitiva. Papa Voitiva, sì. Che film hai visto e vedi oggi? Ma non so, sai, anche lì dipende dalle, dalle varie stagioni della vita. Insomma, film che mi piacevano da ragazzo, poi avanti negli anni sono diversi. Oggi quali sono i film che mi piacerebbe andare a vedere? Perché poi non, non ci vado, vado pochissimo al cinema. Ma eh, quelli di 007 li ho visti quasi tutti, forse non tutti, ma parecchi. No? Mi restituiscono alla, alla, alla condizione dello spettatore innocente, sprovveduto, quindi mi piacciono, a parte il fatto che sono fatti benissimo proprio. Eh. E io ritengo che questi film qui, questi film di 007, sono la testimonianza del periodo che stiamo vivendo, molto più di tanti altri film che presuntuosamente pretendono di offrire uno spaccato così della società. Mi sembra che nei, nei film di 007 sia proprio espressa l'angoscia, il cinismo, la ferocia, e tutto poi riscattato da, da una grande fantasia che anche questa fa parte insomma, del bisogno che oggi c'è di credere in una specie di scienza magica, di scienza capace di, di, appunto, di rivaleggiare, di competere, di superare proprio l'aspetto così stregonesco de, della realtà, l'aspetto magico. Quindi mi sembrano dei film più importanti di quello forse che i loro stessi attori hanno pensato, che probabilmente pensavano soltanto di fare delle storie d'avventure realizzate con grande dovizia di mezzi e con una figuratività molto suggestiva. Ma i film che mi piacciono, che, che mi piacerebbe vedere o rivedere sono sempre i film comici, dei bei film comici. Ecco. Totò. Sì, Totò, sì, lui, perché il, il film poi alla fine insomma, bisognerebbe isolare lui, lui è sempre una marionetta che sta a guardare con lo stesso eh, incantamento con cui guardi, non so, la, la, il, il 
ceppo che brucia nel camino, insomma, una, una, una marionetta inesauribile di fascio, di suggestioni, di significati. Di... Ma i film, anche i film americani insomma, di Marx Brazzard, ecco, è una, un vecchio, una vecchia cotta che resiste alla, al tempo, insomma, trovo che erano dei clown straordinari, dei comici straordinari. Uh, che genere di film ti piaceva vedere una volta e ti piace vedere ancora adesso? Beh, no, oggi devo dire che vedo soltanto Fellini, no, non vado più al cinema, a me piaceva moltissimo prima il cinema, ecco, amavo moltissimo René Clair, John Ford, il cinema che era cinema, insomma. Oggi quando entro in una sala cinematografica mi viene da uscire gridando viva René Clair. Hai qualche altro mito cinematografico, a parte sia regista che attore, a parte Fellini e René Clair? Beh, non so, dovrei verificare il cinema francese per esempio de, della seconda metà degli anni 30 mi affascinava molto Giovivier, Carnet eh, però no, non ho più rivisto questi film poi c'è un film che, che io metto proprio al vertice di, di tutto ed è la grande illusione di Renoir però dovrei rivederlo ecco e un'attrice che per te è rimasta mitica o lo è tuttora? Non c'è. Un'attrice? Ah, un'attrice. Beh, non direi la Garbo, non direi Marlene Trice, che, che erano de, dei grandi miti, no? Collettivi. Sì, ma, che so, Barbara Stein, per esempio, un'attrice molto dimenticata, che però ha fatto un film con Capra, che, che ricordo co, con molto interesse ancora. to show you and we are very grateful to bring from Italy this documentary the video that was the first time the world see it and I think it's the perfect way to open our session in which I invite uh, Gaetana <coughs> Marrone Puglia to join me please and so important so long the biography the scientific biography that I don't want to make it long just because I don't want you to be late for the train so the important thing I think is the uh, last Report of the cinema of Francesco Rosi, published in 2020, and now she's currently working on a book project titled The Landscape of Memory, the cinema of Roberto Andò, so we're still in Shasha territory. And very important, I think she is co-editor of Annali di Italianistica, and so we collaborate. So please, in the big welcome, Gaetana Marroni. Thank you, Valerio. Thank you uh, uh, also for this. Uh, um, we had the right, uh, uh, Antonio and I had the right beginning with this interview. We could spend days discussing how our directors say things that we can contradict right away, right away. Um, why uh, Rosie and Shasha? First of all, um, they were friends. Uh, but I would like to begin by sharing, uh, and these are elements that come out very well in the book uh, by Joseph Farrell, um, what they had in common as artists. First of all, for Shasha, as we read in Le Parrocchie di Regalpetra, he believed in human reason and in the liberty and justice which flows from reason. Uh, This is exactly the position of Francesco Rosi. Shasha's typical protagonist is male, an animal rationalis. So is Francesco Rosi, Francesco Rosi. The essay inquiries, politically and socially engaged, are the definition of Shasha's uh, fiction for Rosi, filmed in Chiesta for Shasha, and here 
we, we have to think what he just said. The reader of the detective fiction is like a cinema spectator, he writes. He, she must abandon passivity for an active role. Uh, for Rosie, the film spectator must abandon the classical Hollywood passivity and be an active uh, spectator. They both work for factual truth, what Rosie called the cinema documentato. They both aim at the pursuit of a truth which is relative, what Rosie calls another possible truth that is set against the official version. The labyrinth, another element that Joe brings so well in his study of uh, Shasha, uh, the puzzle has no other solution but to sustain the enigma. That is also Rosie's uh, pattern in his most celebrated films. They both love Spain, Spain. And uh, I, I would like to also mention that Francesco Rosi was offered uh, to make a film on Aldo Moro. Uh, he loved La Fermoro, but he declined because at the time he felt that the documents uh, were not uh, um, distant enough for him to make a film documentato. Uh, so I will touch upon a, a, a few elements uh, in the adaptation of Il Contesto uh, as Cadaveri Eccellenti in 1976. Rosie recounts that on his way back from New York, where he had met Dino De Laurentiis for a film he had envisioned with Garcia Marquez, which was never financed, he happened to read Il Contesto, a book he had with himself on the plane. Upon landing in Rome, he immediately contacted Alberto Grimaldi and Shasha, who did not hesitate to support it. Grimaldi's own company, Pea, produced the film in association with Les Artistes Associés of Paris. Over the years, Rossi's cinematic inquiries have probed the central questions plaguing post-war Italy. The instability of the Democratic Republic threatened by political corruption, the mafia, terrorism, the rise of global capitalism, the influence of the past on Italy's unsettled present. Shasha's novel comprised several of these issues and sublimely evoked Sicily. In the early 70s, Rossi observed, what one sees in Sicily is the arrogance of a hidden power which I refuse to call mafia so as not to generalize it or glamorize it. One feels that there is a power which succeeds in channeling things wherever it wants. This unfathomable power finds its most haunting representation in Cadaver Eccellenti, which might well be Rosie's best film in the detective inquiry next to Salvatore Giuliano. The title, as we know, uh, Cadaveri Eccellenti refers to high profile victims of the mafia, politicians, judges, and police uh, chiefs, all executed. Deploying his own metodo dell'inchiesta, Rosie breaks with the documented realism of previous films and devises a neo-baroque view of the South as an iconic site of corruption, conspiracy, suspicion. He combines different geographical settings, filming in Palermo, Agrigento, Naples, Lecce, and Rome for the interiors, what Tullio Kecic calls in his review an impressive patchwork of the South. In a footnote, Shasha calls his novel a fable about power anywhere in the world, about power that in the impenetrable form of a concatenation that we roughly term mafioso, works steadily greater degradation. Set in an imaginary country that might be Italy or Sicily, where principles are mocked and ideologies reduced to political gain, in which only power for power's sake counts. 
il contesto offer Rose an opportunity in particular to meditate on his political unease with historic compromise. In a 79 interview with Le Monde, Shasha compares the political machine to, I quote, a system of lies, a vast monstrous machine that gulps down all the truth and spits out lies and predicts that, quote, the state will end up identifying with this machine. It will have nothing in common with the people, with the notion of human beings in which we still live. In his film, Rosy focuses focuses on this system of lies rather than on the individuals like Giuliano, Mattei, or Luciano who played with power. In Sicily, the mafia has become an organic component of the national organization of government, what Rosy called the plague that has infected Palermo and Naples, cities well aware of their illness that plague has contaminated the state. The plague becomes the subject and subtext of Cadaveri Eccellenti, which stars Lino Ventura as police inspector Amerigo Rogazas, who is sent from Rome to investigate the violent death of public prosecutor Varga, and soon uncovers a vast right-wing conspiracy of high-ranking officials aimed at inciting public outrage against the left. The plot unfolds around a series of unsolved murders, the victims all jurists. At the start, the murderers appear, the, uh, appear to be the act of an individual pursuing personal revenge for an unjust verdict. But as Rogers digs deeper into the cases, he begins to have doubts. The motives for violence turn out to be political. In the last sequence of the film, the inspector calls a meeting with Amar, the secretary of the Communist Party, to reveal his findings. They are both assassinated. As he began production in April 75, Rosi noted that since the political climate had changed from Shasha's time, the book needed a historical reassessment. Rose's intention became to engage his audience in a debate on a major political initiative launched by Enrico Berlinguer uh, of the Communist, Part, uh, the Communist Party Secretary, the Historic Compromise, an alliance of the Italian communists with the Christian Democrats and socialists to govern the country during these critical years of political instability. Shasha was no enthusiast of the compromise and he never saw it as an answer to a political decadent system. Rose's interpretative tool is embodied in an honest individual who confronts what Morandini calls in his review of the film, the monsters and the monstrosity of power. Rosa Rogas undertakes, says Rosie, a metaphysical journey into uncertainty because when a man who believes blindly in justice begins to understand that he must doubt, the ground starts to slide from under his feet. For Rosy, the dynamics of power reproduces itself everywhere with the same mechanism. And I'm quoting many times from his script notes. It's Italy, but could well be Spain or South America. The capital is not just Rome, but everywhere state bureaucrats and institutions are. Shasha defines the conflict of values between the detective and the criminal as transcendental and spiritual, not just legal, social, or political. That detective fiction is, in essence, as Joe Farrell writes, a letter day morality tale with a morality which was applied and never abstract. 
the just man's twisting course in searching out of truth is figured in the labyrinth whose winding paths lead to a hidden centers where the sinister monster of corrupt political institutions lies. Rogas is a person without a history. Conforming to noir standards, he wears the classical raincoat, lives alone as a wife, distant, and unlike regular policemen, is not a team player. We only know, as the chief of police states, that he is the finest detective we've got. For this role, Rosie chose Lino Ventura, the star of many French policiers. Ventura was often, uh, often played the commissaire, and his performances brought critics to dub him a melancholy Maigret or a European Marlowe. Simenon, Raymond Chandler, they were favorite, particularly Raymond, Simenon of, uh, of Shasha. And uh, this choice was definitely dictated by uh, Shasha's preference. Besides Ventura, the cast of Cadaveri Eccellenti includes Fernando Rey, Max von Sydon, Charles Vanel, Alain Cuny. Uh, I would like to touch upon uh, one or two of uh, uh, the differences uh, between the book and, uh, and the film. And I have to uh, anticipate uh, that when the film was released, uh, Shasha himself declared in an interview that he felt the film was faithful in spirit uh, to his novel. The film begins uh, with a powerful sequence set in the Capuchin catacombs of Palermo. And if you've been in Palermo, you can visualize the setting. Where a mysterious figure is visiting the crypt, is later identified as Varga, and we are told that he visited every Sunday so that, quote, he could learn the secrets of the livings from the dead. Visually, this is one of Rose's memorable openings. It begins with a dim lit underground tunnel, and as we hear the echo of footsteps, the light slowly fades up. A man walks slowly towards the camera, and as he reaches the lens, in a close-up, the camera pans with him to reveal a line of mummified bodies hanging upright along the walls. The film cuts to a close-up, and as the man lifts his head, an act of deference, the music fades up, followed by a series of detailed shots of individual skulls. The camera then dollies to reveal the great expanse of the creek. Near the end of the walkway, the old man stops, looks one more time in an extreme long shot, then puts back his head and slowly moves up towards the steps leading to the outside sunlight, Chopin's funeral march for Shadows films to come. As you may remember, the opening is extremely um, uh, dense uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the novel, and the first judge is eliminated in a, with very few words. Uh, the, this setting of the Capuchin catacombs are, are effectively used to establish the film's thematic and visual context. Contrary to Shasha, uh, very a uh, few lines uh, uh, in dismissing the first judge, La Rosie lingers on images of funereal splendor, thus establishing death as the film's dominant presence. The judge, dispatched by an assassin, soon joins the role of skeletons, setting in motion what Lino Michike wrote, a feral journey in a land of death where a dying power breeds cadavers and pursues an aberrant ideology of repression and physical elimination. Uh, Rose's film reflects the pervasive violence of the mid-1970s, when violence escalated and judges were ex executed. And we all remember 
that the first of these excellent cadavers was Pietro Scaglione, the chief prosecutor of Palermo, who was killed by the mafia in 1971 and sublimely inspired uh, Rosie's uh, Vargas funeral scene. Also another stunning sequence uh, uh, where Rosie will combine Shasha's uh, sense of Sicilian uh, light, colors, um, smells, uh, by indulging in uh, the first encounter with Varga, where we are going to see once he has it, he is approaching uh, the jasmines, he's holding in his hand, and then Rosie cuts down uh, and he dies holding the jasmines. In the funeral, uh, the archbishops will quote Garcia Lorca, and the symbol of the jasmine becomes the symbol of life as it should be, life as light, the opposite of the darkness uh, where uh, the inspector will have uh, to uh, uh, under undertake. Uh, the detective novel embodies Shasha's belief in reason as well is disappointment when reason fails and the guilty remain unpunished. In Rosie's Noir, the fundamental conflict is not between crime and the discovery of the culprit, but between order and chaos, two other elements so important in uh, um, uh, Shasha's uh, fictions. Uh, the crimes which are fold in serial fashion um, will challenge uh, Inspector Rogers when uh, he realizes that Vargas' assassination is followed by Sanza, Calamo, Rust, all shot by the same 22 caliber rifle. The last victim, however, overturns the official supported theory of a wild madman, an individual seeking revenge on the judges whose error sent him to prison. But as Rogers communist journalist friend Cusano remarks, one judge gunned down is a matter of the police. Four judges becomes political. Then Rogers abandons his own suspicion that the assassin is an innocent victim and discovers that Cress, the pharmacist, was convicted of a domestic case of attempted murder. Um, poisoning his wife, and he has nurtured hatred against the legal system, uh, believing that this is a potential threat uh, to the president of the high court, uh, he will visit Riches, played by Mark Forsyden. And you remember in the novel, the lengthy conversation between the two that in Rose's film basically become focused on the definition of the law when Riches will say uh, that uh, the judge may investigate, doubt, but the moment the sentence is draw, then there is no possibility of error in justice. Of course, uh, uh, Riches will soon be assassinated as well. Uh, the film takes an unexpected turn when Prosecutor Pearl is killed in the capital and Rogers is transferred to the political squad and uh, is told to investigate reports of young protesters with long hair or revolt against order and authority. Rogers soon realizes that the police are not only spying young activists, but also aim their cameras and microphones at journalists, politicians, and judges themselves. Uh, so uh, this is when the labyrinth motif, so dear to Rose's uh, um, uh, screenplay, uh, will be fully developed because the, the, the inspector enters a maze of underground conspiracies, wandering through different architectural patterns uh, uh, and uh, uh, again, 
I, I will quote my friend Joe Farrell, where he, he writes, Rogue steps into the world of Chestertonian fantasy cum nightmare. Um, what um, is impressing in Rosie that he actually, uh, in having Rogers go underground uh, as he looks at this political um, uh, spying, uh, he reverses uh, the panoptical uh, tower of Foucault, uh, where from the high uh, the inmates are being spied. While here we are underground uh, and through all possible medium, they will spy above. So this reversal um, uh, leads uh, uh, power uh, to uh, 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 expand its role as an eye that has embraced uh, um, the life uh, of the citizens uh, uh, and progress realizes that will be uncontrollable. Another uh, stunning moment in the film is also when Rosie compound the lengthy um, dialogues uh, that Rogas has uh, uh, with various members um, of uh, uh, the high level uh, institutions in, uh, in a party, uh, in a party uh, at Pato's house, where you meet uh, who is who in the high um, power level, and uh, he entrusted uh, Renato Guttuso, Mario Ceroli, and Mario Schifano to work with the decor, very sumptuous. So he condenses visually uh, the labyrinth of dialogues and words uh, that uh, Shasha uses uh, through uh, visual references uh, besides very short dialogues uh, um, that uh, uh, Rogas, uh, uh, above all, uh, perceives, uh, and above all, he becomes a kind of Pirandellian uh, spectator um, uh, looking at the display of, of masks. Uh, uh, but I, I would like, uh, uh, in a way, uh, to conclude uh, uh, with uh, uh, the closing, the closing of the film, uh, which uh, um, uh, diverts from uh, the novel. Uh, not only uh, we have the scene at the art museum uh, where Rogers meets Amar, um, uh, uh, the communist leader, to reveal secretly his own findings, um, uh, and but. Uh, uh, Rosie works uh, with Greco-Roman statuary to give the eye that will oversee what will happen as these two men meet. And uh, again, uh, the music is very important in setting up uh, their encounter. Uh, Rosie also has uh, a leading shot of a wide window uh, implying that the shooting will come from the outside. Uh, the outside, uh, even though uh, the official version will become what Shasha had, uh, that uh, um, there is uh, uh, a, a murder-suicide, uh, and uh, uh, the leftist party will endorse it uh, not to create chaos. But Rosie doesn't close the film with Rogers and Amar's deaths. He will give us a montage of protesters with red flags, and then he cuts to the Communist Party headquarters with two men, Cusano and a Democratic politician, arguing as, about these killings as uh, they approach uh, Renato Gottuso's painting, I funerali di Togliatti. Uh, Shasha has been mentioned so much uh, uh, during uh, many uh, presentations. Uh, he loved uh, not only writers, but also painters. And in, in the novel, Amar and Rogers uh, uh, are discovered under Velasquez, Lazaro Cardenas, and the Madonna della Catena, 
both fictitious paintings. In Rosi, we have uh, Guttuso, a uh, very important painting, but he also adds uh, one final leading sentence, the truth is not always revolutionary. Uh, Rosi reverses the motto mistakenly attributed to Antonio Gramsci. Uh, it, it is the motto of Ferdinand Lazal, telling the truth is revolutionary. Uh, and as uh, the camera moves closer to the painting, the final credits begin to roll. Um, why would Rosie end with this quote? Some interpreted it as a signal of Rosie's skepticism and the decision of the left uh, not to bring radical uh, change anymore. Um, uh, uh, Gottuso himself defined the, the, the ending of the film, chilling, there was a big, a big uh, controversy with uh, uh, communist leaders and so on. Uh, but Cadaveri Eccellenti, um, writes Rosi, began a, as a journey in the company of a detective who starts believing in the institutions of the state and in the end he no longer does. Pessimism? Yes, a pessimism of reason and of the courage to see things as they are. Hopelessness? No, but a potential fight that will always oppose law to the abuse of power and reason to force. And I would like to close that the United Artists bought the rights of the film and never and never promoted it because of the red flags that the film went to Cannes and uh, it was shelled for 15 years. It was taken out of distribution. Rosi was sued uh, for vilipendio alle istituzioni and was acquitted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this really insightful presentation. And to be honest, I think through words, she gave us the image of the movies that we well known. So enlightening words and, and let us imagine the movies as well. Now, in fact, Antonio Monda will show us some clips discussing those movies. So I think it's a perfect session actually. So from images in the world and now word through images. So we all know Antonio Monda, but let me just introduce it briefly. There's, as we know, he's an Italian writer, filmmaker, and professor at the New York University. He's the artistic director of the film, the Festival of Literature, Le Conversazioni, and the artistic director of the Rome Film Festival from 2017 to 2022. He's a reporter from La Repubblica, La Stampa, Vogue, Rai News, 20, Rai News 24, among the many awards he received for his novels and for his work, in 2019 he received the Order of Merit of Italian Republic by, by our president, Sergio Mattarella. Many books, many novels, I just quote a few titles that are the books that I prefer. L'America non esiste, that's my favorite, obviously, but apparently here we are. Uh, L'evidenza delle cose non viste, uh, Mondadori 2017. Io sono il fuoco, Milano Mondadori 2018. El principe del mondo, 2021. I'm pretty sure he's preparing another one next time we'll present it. So please enjoy me to welcome Antonio Mondo. Ho chiesto il permesso di poter parlare in italiano, quindi vi chiedo scusa in anticipo perché ne leggerò alcuni brani proprio di Sciascia in italiano. Allora, buonasera, grazie per questo invito. Saluto Gaetana Marone dove faccio i complimenti, non ci vediamo da tanti anni, proprio con Rosi ci siamo visti l'ultima volta. Io ho scelto un po' di sequenze e le prime due sono proprio da cadaveri eccellenti, una delle due è quella iniziale che secondo me è formidabile. 
però per parlare di queste conseguenze voglio dire qualcosina su Sciascia, su Sciascia l'uomo e l'intellettuale, perché secondo me ci sono delle parole chiave per capirne un po' il percorso intellettuale. E io mi sento, e non lo dico certo paragonandomi, non sarò una così pazzo, lontanissimo dal suo mondo, dalla sua cultura, dal suo sguardo, tuttavia ne ho una profonda ammirazione perché era un uomo di sincera libertà intellettuale ed è stato perennemente alla ricerca. Lo si vede in politica, ha iniziato come consigliere comunale nel Partito Comunista, poi è passato ai radicali, poi è passato ai socialisti. Pochi anni prima di morire scrisse una lunga lettera a Caxi dicendo quanto ammirava i suoi sforzi politici. Probabilmente questo è dovuto anche all'amicizia con Francesco Rossi, che come sappiamo era socialista, un po' un'anomalia nel mondo cinematografico italiano. E ha cambiato perennemente il suo modo di vedere, il suo modo di, di affrontare anche la politica. Lui è stato per esempio contrarissimo a qualcosa che invece in Italia è addirittura celebrata e venerata, e in questo mi sento vicino a lui, la famosa intervista fatta da Eugenio Scalfari ad Enrico Berlinguer sulla questione morale. E lui considerava, e molto più umilmente considero anch'io, una svolta pericolosissima, perché si passa dagli ideali, anzi dalle ideologie al moralismo. Eh, non sono i nostri ideali essere migliori di quelli degli altri, ma noi siamo più onesti degli altri. Lui capiva il pericolo enorme che ha portato a quello che vediamo in questi giorni. È stato il primo a dire qualcosa di profondamente controverso e per questo fu crocifisso sui famosi professionisti dell'antimafia, eh, puntando l'indice su una vittima della mafia, che sia chiaro, che, al quale dobbiamo soltanto eh, portare omaggio, che è Paolo Borsellino, l'altro era Leo Luca Orlando, non Giovanni Falcone. Cosa intendeva? C'è chi eh, di una battaglia nobile usa, eh, usa una battaglia nobile, scusate, per fare carriera. Questo non significa che la battaglia sia estremamente nobile e doverosa. La mafia scrisse, e poi vi faccio vedere la prima sequenza, si combatte non con la tensione delle sirene, dei cortei e della terribilità. La mafia si combatte con il diritto. Ora vediamo due sequenze, però mi dovete dire come devo fare. Faccio io un play normale? Sì, forse ce la faccio da solo. E, e la prima sequenza è proprio dal... Aspetta, vediamo se riesco pure a ingrandirlo. Sì, sono così e dal cadavere eccellente ed è una sequenza di come va? non va che cos'è che non va? tutto e prima? prima di che? prima di condava? no e allora? Allora eccoci qua. Cosa ne pensi di questi ammazzamenti di giudici? Fu Varga che ti condannò? Era il pubblico ministero in quel processo. Mi voleva fare dare 30 anni. Mi dispiaceva, disse, che non c'era più la pena di morte. E fu il presidente Sanza a emettere la sentenza? Il giudice Sanza mi fece uno sconto, mi fece dare 27 anni, ma non c'era solo lui. Lo so, c'era anche il giudice Rasto. E Rasto è ancora vivo. Che vuole da me lei? Hanno provato che ero innocente. Appunto. Eri innocente e ti sei fatto quattro anni di carcere ingiustamente. Ne ho fatti 52 di vita ingiustamente. I quattro che ho passato in carcere non mi pesano. Il carcere è sicuro. Per me 
direi qui anche se la sequenza è molto bella anche dopo, poi chiederò al tecnico di vedere la seconda sequenza da Galeria Eccellente. Ecco, qui c'è moltissimo sia del cinema di Rosi che del, dello spirito di Sciascia. E Rosi eh, scrittura due attori francesi, anche se Lino Ventura, dal girato al nome si capisce, è di origine italiana, e anche l'altro, Mazze Bozzuffi o Bozzuffi, forse ve lo ricordate nel braccio violento della legge, uno dei cattivi. E il dialogo è formidabile ed è quasi alla lettera preso da Sciascia. Eh, ho vissuto ingiustamente, non solo sono stato in carcere 5 anni, ma ho vissuto, quanto dice, 54 anni ingiustamente. E poi cos'è che non va? Tutto. Cioè non c'è niente che va, c'è tutto il pessimismo, lo scetticismo, e la cupezza di chi sa già la fine delle cose. Tuttavia, al netto di questo, ci sono due elementi che rendono la vita degna di essere vissuta e il lavoro degno di essere svolto il credere in qualcosa e Lino Ventura crede nel diritto che è uno degli elementi chiave di tutta la scrittura di Sciascia e di tutto il suo eh, percorso intellettuale lui era convinto in tempi non sospetti negli anni Ottanta di qualcosa che è assolutamente attuale adesso se il potere politico è sottoposto all'ordine giudiziario se, se non c'è un equilibrio ma uno dei due è superiore all'altro finisce il paese, muore il paese e lo dice in quel momento, anche se lo dice secondo una, una struttura gialla, questa è un'altra anomalia, abbiamo avuto anche degli altri giallisti, in Sicilia più recentemente Camilleri, Scerbanenco, nell'Italia del Nord e del Nord Est, però quelli di, di, di Sciascia sono dei, è un metagenere, cioè lui affronta il, il giallo non tanto per cercare chi è il colpevole, anche se è interessante sapere chi è, ma per affrontare altri temi come appunto il diritto e il senso ultimo dell'esistenza. Su questa nota, se può venire, io dovrei vedere la seconda sequenza, che è proprio l'avvio di cadaveri eccellenti di cui ha parlato, vediamo un minuto, di cui ha parlato un attimo fa eh, Gaetano. Il libro, come dicevamo, è il contesto del 1971, il film è del 1979, e Rossi, come no, no, questa è, è colpire porte aperte. E il, il, lui chiamò a sceneggiarlo, anche questo è segno di libertà intellettuale. Lino Iannuzzi, che è un personaggio certamente di grande intelligenza e cultura, ma lontanissimo politicamente. E, la e, e, sì, la scena iniziale. E Tonino Guerra, grande poeta, grande sceneggiatore. Vorrei far vedere solo i primi... Ecco qua. I primi 30 secondi. Questo è l'avvio che diceva Gaetana. E c'è il giudice, interpretato, se si può levare la luce perché è bello, proprio come immagine, se si può. E il giudice che entra nella cripta dei Cappuccini di Palermo, io sono voluto andare a visitarli, è abbastanza impressionante. E cosa fa? Contempla la morte. Prima Gaetana ha citato giustamente... Uh, due cose, una che non sapevo che lui eh, Rossi volesse fare un film dall'affare Moro ne parliamo tra un attimo ma l'altra cosa è il rapporto con Marquez ecco c'è uno dei suoi romanzi gli ultimi romanzi in generale sul labirinto che parla dell'autorevolezza della morte ed è quello che si vede in questo momento ed è uno degli incipi cinematografici più forti del cinema italiano Terzo attore francese, eh? tutti, attori, tutti personaggi siciliani. Sentite in sottofondo si sente una, una banda, probabilmente un funerale che sta passando. E come ha raccontato Gaetana, fra un po' lui coglierà dei fiori, non, non so che fiori siano sinceramente, e muore anche lui. 
fermo qua. Prima di passare al secondo, uh, alla seconda sequenza, al secondo film che voglio farvi vedere, perché Shash ha avuto il, uh, come ha raccontato in quella bella intervista di Rita Cirio, uh, è stato uno degli autori italiani più adattati sullo schermo. Chi sa un pochino di cinema sa che i produttori, ma anche i registi, cercano dai romanzi non necessariamente la buona letteratura. E non voglio minimamente dire che Sciascia non sia un buon scrittore, un eccellente scrittore. Ma quello che cercano eh, è il, um, dei grandi personaggi e un grande plot. Eh, faccio sempre questo esempio, il padrino, che non è grande letteratura, ma ha grandi personaggi e un grande plot. Certamente nei libri di Sciascia queste due cose ci sono. In più, lui ha scritto il meglio della sua produzione nel momento in cui c'era il cosiddetto cinema impegnato, quello di Rosi, Petri, non a caso Rosi ha fatto un film, Petri 2, Damiano Damiani un altro e Gianni Amelio vedremo fra un attimo un terzo. È interessante ricordare che questo uomo affascinato dalla cultura e poi diventato profondamente colto, anzi un pozzo di cultura, non era neanche laureato, aveva la, il liceo come l'ultimo anno di studio ed era un maestro elementare che anche per quanto riguarda la sua produzione è stato eclettico e questo eclettismo nasce proprio dalla ricerca continua, è stato un poeta, è stato un saggista, è stato un pamflettista, ricordo a tutti l'ultimo libro pubblicato, Futura Memoria, in cui polemizza, come dicevo prima, con Eugenio Scalfari in maniera abbastanza potente, e anche con Italo Calvino, il quale però, al quale bisogna però dare, eh, riconoscere l'onore assoluto di essere stato tra i primi che l'hanno scoperto insieme a Pierpaolo Pasolini, e proprio Calvino scrisse a Giuliano Naudi raccomandando Sciascia con queste parole. Eh, ti accludo uno scritto di un maestro elementare, perché Sciascia era un maestro elementare, dirà Calmuto, tra parentesi agrigento, che mi sembra molto impressionante e il, titolo, il termine impressionante è abbastanza affascinante. Vediamo adesso questo secondo film che vi faccio vedere è Porte Aperte di, eh, di, scusate, di Gianni Amelio. Scondivido con Gaetana che Cadaveri Eccellenti è uno dei grandi film dimenticati di Rosi. Io ne metterei un terzo tra i suoi migliori insieme all'altro che hai citato che è Salvatore Giuliano, che è il caso Mattei, che personalmente io amo moltissimo. Questo è un film che è stato girato nel 1990, è un dialogo tra Gian Maria Volontè, che è il protagonista, e Renato Carpentieri. Anche questo è un giallo, ma un giallo, ripeto, metafisico. E da questo dialogo si possono tirare fuori delle, delle, delle indicazioni su chi. Buongiorno, signor Giudice. Permettete? Dato che stamattina abbiamo fatto presto, allora io ho pensato, quasi quasi non torno a casa. Io sono di fuori, sapete? E a Palermo non scendo mai. Guardate che cosa ho comprato. I sementi così non se ne trovano. Questa è una lattughella che cresce quasi senza acqua, sapete? Mi dispiace per come è andata la perizia. E perché mi dispiace? Voi vi siete stato con un gemirante, l'unico. Prima di venire qua, sono passato dal negozio di Palermo, quello che vende le stoffe. E là c'erano tutti gli altri giurati che parlavano, confabulavano. E uno ha detto, se non è pazzo, allora se ha fatto quello che ha fatto... Non è manco un essere umano, è una bestia, un mostro. È una normalità. È normale che la pensino così, tutti la pensano così, non scrivono. La perizia psichiatrica è stata chiesta proprio per togliere ogni dubbio. Forse era meglio se non si faceva, si può dire. Caro signore. Ognuno si assume le sue responsabilità. Perciò che mi riguarda, ho ritenuto mio dovere chiedere la perizia di un medico legale. Questo è stato votato e così è stato fatto. Io volevo, signor giudice, no, no. non era per criticare. No, Possiamo fermarci qui, secondo me la parola chiave è responsabilità. 
però vi voglio prima leggere un brano sempre di Shash riguardo al problema del diritto perché lui individua nel problema del diritto non solo una mancanza di equilibrio rispetto al problema esecutivo e, e al potere politico ma eh, un possibile credo avere un baluardo, lui era ateo anche se nella parte finale di questo mio intervento cercherò di parlare anche del suo rapporto con lo spirito lui era ateo ma credeva fondamentalmente nei pilastri del diritto in qualcosa in cui dobbiamo credere fino in fondo e qui scrive così a proposito del diritto e della mafia la democrazia non è impotente a combattere la mafia o meglio non c'è nulla nel suo sistema nei suoi principi che necessariamente la porti a non poter combattere la mafia a imporle una convivenza con la mafia anzi tra le mani lo strumento che la tirannia non ha il diritto la legge uguale per tutti la bilancia della giustizia vedete ha un, ha un approccio quasi, quasi religioso rispetto al, al diritto se al simbolo della bilancia si sostituisse quello delle manette, come alcuni fanatici dell'antimafia in cuor loro desiderano, saremmo perduti irrimediabilmente, come nemmeno il fascismo ci è riuscito. Quindi lui ha una posizione assolutamente garantista, è questo che lo porta ad avvicinarsi al partito radicale, a difendere eh, apertamente, fino in fondo in suo torto, e anche giustamente, perché come sapete è stato vittima di uno scandalo giudiziario, e poi anche Adriano Sofio, su questo non mi esprimo perché non ho le carte per dare un, un, un giudizio al riguardo, ma lui certamente era favorevole, era garantista, riteneva che non fosse colpevole. Detto questo, lui da un lato ha una posizione quindi garantista, se non iper garantista, da un altro lato crede fino in fondo nell'applicazione del diritto. E ritorniamo alle responsabilità. La storia di Porta Aperte, che prende il titolo da un detto durante il fascismo, che era, la vita era così sicura che si poteva dormire con le porte aperte, è la storia di un, di un triplice omicidio per cui viene condannato una persona ma il giudice interpretato da Gian Maria Volontè eh, è profondamente contrario per questioni eh, umanitarie alla pena di morte che invece il fascismo o comunque i gerarchi fascisti e i dirigenti politici dell'epoca volevano applicare come esempio ecco, questa è una cosa che fa orrore a Sciascia una pena data come esempio, cioè quindi si disumanizza anche quando c'è un criminale di mezzo. La storia è terribile perché Volontè, il personaggio del giudice, riesce a far cambiare la pena di morte in ergastolo, e, ma poi in appello viene eh, così dice, ricambiato di nuovo e viene applicata la pena di morte. Lui però, anche se perde giuridicamente, si sente vittorioso moralmente, sente che ha combattuto la buona battaglia. E qui arriviamo al terzo punto che è quello spirituale, la buona battaglia di cui parla San Paolo a Timoteo, no? l'onore di vivere. E su questo voglio passare alla clip successiva che forse non il film più bello, perché ritengo che il più bello è Cadaveri Eccellenti, ma il libro più bello di Leonardo Sciascia, cioè Il giorno della civetta, e, e vi faccio vedere la scena con la fase, frase forse più famosa di tutta la letteratura di Sciascia. Io divido l'umanità in cinque categorie. Ci sono gli uomini veri, i mezzi uomini, gli ominicchi, poi mi scusi, il ruffiane. E in ultimo, come se non ci fossero, i quacquara qua. Sono pochissimi gli uomini, i mezzi uomini pochi, già molti di più gli uomini ricchi. Sono come bambini che si credono grandi. Quanto ai ruffiani, stanno diventando un vero esercito. E infine, i quacquara qua, il branco di oche. Ci fermiamo qua. Vabbè, la battuta è famosissima, è curioso che... Oh wow, the first è, è interessante notare che nel film che ne ha tratto Damiano Damiani eh, c'è un cambiamento forse dovuto al, come dire, alla censura del tempo perché nel libro dice piglia in culo invece viene detto ruffiani scusate per l'espressione ma così dice, così dice Sciascia e cosa racconta questo? Uh, innanzitutto questa sequenza è sconcertante perché quello che dice il personaggio 
e in buona parte condivisibile, ma chi parla è un capo mafia, cioè eh, Don Mariano è l'assassino, è il criminale, il quale qui nella sequenza non si vede alla fine dice io riconosco in lei, il capitano Bellodi si chiama, interpretato da Franco Nero, un vero uomo, lei appartiene alla prima categoria e sono felice di essere arrestato da lei. E, e qui c'è un'altra cosa spiazzante perché... Eh, la frase più famosa, la frase più bella, la frase più che rimane alla storia è affidata a un capo mafia. Anche questo è un capovolgimento non da poco, è un segno anche questo di libertà intellettuale. E, e, um, il libro, ma anche il film, Damiani è stato un buon regista, ma certamente non come Rosi, non come Amelio, non come lo stesso Petrick, di cui vedremo fra un attimo la sequenza. Insomma, non, non vola come, come volerebbe eh, un grande regista con queste parole però racconta essenzialmente un contrasto tra due culture, perché nel profondo sud, in Sicilia, viene a fare un'indagine un poliziotto che viene dal nord. Una persona retta, onesta, per bene, tant'è che il capo mafia riconosce in lui un uomo, un vero uomo, che però in prima battuta è completamente spiazzato e sconcertato dai modi, le usanze, le tradizioni, anche l'omertà mafiosa. E qui c'è un passaggio che secondo me è molto bello, che purtroppo non, non trova spazio nel cinema, nel, nel film. Si sentiva come un convalescente, sensibilissimo, tenero, affamato. Al diavolo la Sicilia, al diavolo tutto. Rincasò verso mezzanotte attraversando tutta la città a piedi. Parma era incantata di nevi, bellodi e di Parma. Silenziosa, deserta. In Sicilia le nevicate sono rare, pensò e che forse il carattere delle civiltà era dato dalla neve o dal sole, secondo che neve o sole prevalessero. Si sentiva un po' confuso, ma prima di arrivare a casa sapeva lucidamente di amare la Sicilia e che ci sarebbe tornato. Mi ci romperò la testa, disse a voce alta. Ecco, qui c'è un amore trasfigurato in qualcuno che viene da fuori per scoprire la bellezza del paese, ma anche la sua miseria, anche le sue contraddizioni con attenzione al punto che perfino un personaggio criminale e mafioso dice una profonda verità. Passiamo alle ultime due sequenze, sono due sequenze tratte dallo stesso regista che è Elio Petri, eh, che ha fatto due film da, da, da Sciascia, il primo è A ciascuno il suo eh, e il secondo è Todo Modo. Con Todo Modo concluderò anche se poi c'è un'ultimissima sequenza tratto dal film che avete, avete sentito prima nel, nel documentario, che diceva che lui ha scritto un film soltanto come sceneggiatore che è Bronte di Florestano Vancini eh, e poi ha aggiunto che avrebbe voluto fare o suggeriva di fare un, un film comico su Garibaldi, da buon siciliano non aveva troppa simpatia per Garibaldi. E, comunque insomma questo è Petri, chi, chi non conosce il libro è un altro... <coughs> un altro would done it, dicono in America, chi l'ha fatto? È un giallo, un omicidio. E in un primo momento viene individuato, omicida, e assassino, una persona innocente, ma il commissario, come al solito, che continua a indagare, scopre da una lettera minatoria, nel retro di una lettera minatoria, una scritta, questa scritta è a ciascuno il suo. A ciascuno il suo è la frase unicuique sum che è scritto sotto il titolo del giornale L'Osservatore Romano. Quindi lui si rende conto che eh, se questa persona ha scritto una, una frase sull'Osservatore Romano deve essere un prete o comunque qualcuno che legge l'Osservatore Romano. E da lì parte un'indagine che apre un mondo completamente nuovo. Vediamolo e poi vi dico un paio di cose. Va bene. Schiene. Chi hanno preso? Chi erano? Il padre e i fratelli della selva. A come che pigliassero? Possono essere stati loro e possono essere stati altri. Per me sono innocenti. 
Come fai a essere così sicuro? Eh? Io la lettera anonima l'ho vista bene, era fatta con pezzetti da osservatore romano. E quando mai un contadino legge il giornale dei preti, eh? Dal punto di vista logico, il professore ha ragione. Ma allora, perché non prendo tu le difese di quei tre? Sei un valente della vittima. Mi mm. assumi la difesa e li mettono fuori. Ma sì, lo farei, lo farei. Ma poi, se mia cugina Luisa si costituisse parte civile, mi troverei contro di lei. E se i tre arrestati forse erano alfabeti? Ecco, anche qui l'indagine è appassionante, interessante, ma è soltanto un pretesto. In questo i libri di Sciascia ricordano, secondo me, quelli di Durermatt, cioè eh, sono dei meta gialli, non sono dei veri e propri gialli. Eh, qui è Gian Maria Volontè che è diventato un po' l'attore prediletto dai registi per interpretare Sciascia, lo vedremo anche nel prossimo film. E, mh, e anche qui vi leggo un brano che dice molto su, sull'approccio di di, di Petri prima ma ancora, uh, ancora prima di Sciascia il film fu presentato a Cannes e vinse la migliore sceneggiatura per Petri stesso e Ugo Pirro come commento alla tenacia nelle indagini del professore e alla sua tragica fine l'explicit del libro si risolve in una frase lapidaria era un cretino, disse Don Luigi ecco anche un'uscita così che è uno sberleffo anche per il lettore è segno di una libertà impressionante Passo subito alla, frase, alla, alla sequenza successiva perché sono collegate e poi chiudiamo. Il film è Todo Modo, che uscì nel 1976 ed è eh, ancora una volta con eh, Gian Maria Volontè, ma qui in questa sequenza vedrete Marcello Mastroianni ed è ambientato in un eremo dove ci sono dei... dei Devo dire tutto quello che ho scoperto? Far crollare il castello, ci dobbiamo consegnare al nemico, rovesciare la piramide, i rapporti di classe, cambiare, 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 cambiare cultura, cambiare tutto, devo cambiare veramente. Todo modo, para buscare la volontà divina. Ah, e che cos'è la volontà divina? Non è anima e non è mente, non è immaginazione, né opinione, né ragione, né pensiero, non è numero, ordine, grandezza, piccolezza, uguaglianza, disuguaglianza, non è viva e non è vita, non è spazio, materia, scienza, non è bontà, né verità, non è tenebre, né luce, non è errore, né verità. Io sono un politico, ho bisogno di indicazioni concrete. Tu sei un uomo come tutti gli altri. Ami il potere? Sì, magmaticamente. Sei pronto a cederlo? Eh, e a chi? Non c'è nessuno meglio di me. Sai, io... Credo di avere una missione da compiere, sì. Hai le stigmate? Eh, sì, sì, a volte mi pare di vederle. Sì, 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 sì. Guarda, anche adesso, vedi? Io non le vedo. Tu sei come gli altri. Segui il loro esempio. E non fingere eh, più. No, io non sono come gli altri. Io sono diverso dagli altri, io non sono abile, io non sono arrogante, io non sono ipocrita, io sono una persona per bene, sono una persona onesta, non rubo io, non manco ai fatti, io non rubo io. Ditelo, ditelo, dimmelo anche tu per favore, che non sono come gli altri, dimmi che non sono... Tu sei come i tuoi elettori, cinico e feroce. Segui il tuo mandato fino in fondo, tanto noi due cadremo insieme. Tu, con i tuoi ricchi impostori che ti tengono al governo solo per proteggerli dai poveri. Io con il mio stupido gregge, innocente e peccatore che aspetta da me solo il viatico per l'altro mondo. Tu non mi ami più. Ecco, ci fermiamo qui, poi prima di andare via vi lascio vedere da soli l'ultima sequenza, che è quella da eh, Florestano Mancini.
Dunque, allora, un paio di cose su questo libro, su questo film che si chiama Todo Modo, come dicevo, il titolo prende da, um, la, spunto da una frase famosa che è appena citata di Sant'Ignazio di Loyola, bisogna fare qualunque cosa per la volontà di Dio, in qualunque modo, Todo Modo. Ed è la storia di un pittore che si ritira in un eremo nel film di Petri, una specie di grande garage, le scenografie sono di Dante Ferretti, eh, è un film abbastanza visionario, a rivederlo molto datato e non, non particolarmente riuscito, però certamente interessante per una serie di motivi. Quindi innanzitutto bisogna contestualizzarlo, l'anno era il 1976 e siamo nel momento in cui esplode il terrorismo, due anni dopo sarà eh, rapito e ucciso Aldo Moro, il personaggio del politico è chiaramente Aldo Moro, c'è anche un momento francamente infelice nel film in cui dice dove sedermi a destra o a sinistra io non confondo, confondo sempre la destra con la sinistra un film che scade anche in battute francamente modeste detto questo eh, perché è interessante? perché politicamente è un film molto frontalmente d'attacco a un mondo cattolico in particolarmente quello rappresentato in quegli anni dalla democrazia cristiana ma è un film che mise in imbarazzo il Partito Comunista, perché in quegli anni stavano facendo l'alleanza con la democrazia cristiana, stavano tentando di fare il compromesso storico. Infatti il film fu rinnegato a destra, a sinistra e al centro. Eh, artisticamente devo dire giustamente, perché non è riuscito, però politicamente invece è uno sforzo interessante di cercare di capire alcune cose. Perché ve l'ho voluto far vedere? Perché eh, lo stesso Moro, che nel libro sfuma molto il lato politico è più Petri che spinge sull'acceleratore. Pochi anni dopo, quando Moro viene rapito e ucciso due anni dopo, scrive l'affair Moro e prende una posizione diametralmente opposta proprio sull'uomo Moro, pieno di pietà, pieno di compassione e soprattutto diventa il capofila del, eh, della trattativa. Eh, anche su questo si avvicina alle posizioni di Craxi, anche se anni dopo entrò nel Partito Socialista. Lui sposa completamente la linea della trattativa contro la linea della fermezza che era tenuta da Berlinguer e da gran parte della democrazia cristiana. Questo per dire quanto era in grado di cambiare completamente le proprie idee, non aveva paura di essere ostinatamente legato a un'idea per quanto forte, per quanto anche nobile. E poi c'è l'altro elemento, l'elemento spirituale di cui vi dicevo prima. Eh, lui si è sempre dichiarato ateo, eppure... Il personaggio, questo, in questo era insieme a Umberto Eco, se lo dicevano, io ho avuto il privilegio di sentirlo in, in prima persona da Eco stesso, il punto di riferimento intellettuale ideale che avevano entrambi era un prete, era un prete gesuito, At Atanasio Kirk, e il personaggio di Don Gaetano, che è Mas eh, Marcello Mastroianni, è vagamente ispirato a questo straordinario prete gesuito. Il personaggio è molto più negativo, Kirk non aveva nulla di negativo, poi ha ucciso anche lui, ci sono anche qui una serie di omicidi. Però è un uomo di profonda cultura e profonda ambiguità. Dicevo qualcosa sullo spirito, sul combattere la buona battaglia. Ecco, eh, mi ha molto colpito vedere quello che ha voluto che venisse scritto sulla sua tomba, forse è stato già detto in questo convegno, ve lo dico io. Ce ne ricorderemo l'ha scritto, l'ha chiesto lui, eh? di questo pianeta. E così partecipo della scommessa di Pascal. Sapete cos'è la scommessa di Pascal? Se anche non crediamo, crediamo lo stesso, fidiamoci di chi crede. Allora, ripeto, ce ne ricorderemo di questo pianeta. E così partecipo della scommessa di Pascal. E avverto che una certa attenzione, questa terra, questa vita, la meritano. Prima di chiudere... Vi lascio e spero che queste immagini vi abbiano aiutato eh, su una battuta che ha detto lui, prima nel documentario a parte di sentire Fellini è sempre meraviglioso, tra l'altro quando dice che i film che preferisce sono quelli 007 Fratelli Marx, capisci un fuori classe è solo quello, insomma un regista molto minore avrebbe detto qualche pensoso film tedesco, non lo so e invece lui che amava il cinema ma un cinema un po' scomparso chi ha detto René Clair, John Ford Renoir, anche se Renoir lo deve rivedere una volta gli chiesero perché scrive ecco lui non aveva il mito della scrittura pur essendo un eccellente scrittore per lui i pilastri erano altri il mistero, forse la fede il diritto il rispetto della vita 
e sullo scritt sulla scrittura, e in questo lo metto in relazione al cinema e chiudo, disse così, non bisogna imparare a scrivere ma a vedere, scrivere è una conseguenza. Vi saluto e devo ritornare in classe, scusate. Thank you very much. I think it was very important to have these two insightful um, talks about the cinematographic adaptations, as they both said, was very important in Shasha's uh, novels. And uh, I'm so sorry we don't, but we don't have time and we don't have the speakers for questions. So <laughs> I, uh, we should start with the next and last, the last session of the day. And so it's my pleasure to introduce myself. <laughs> so by the Okay, so uh, since we are well, five minutes late, it's not bad for Italians, so I feel pretty good. So today I would like to, I'm Valerio Capozzo, I'm associate professor at the University of Mississippi, and I have the honor to serve <coughs> as president of the Associazione Amici di Leonardo Sciascia. And especially with Giulia Pelizzato and Salvatore Pappalardo, we are working on the project of the reception of Sciascia in the United States. So it's perfectly fitting this <laughs> conference. Um, so today I would like to summarize some researches that are unveiling uh, many, many different aspects and I would like to pay the attention on the methodology that we are using and that we think is crucial to understand how an author can be understood and received even if uh, you need to go to archives and we need to understand how we can make it possible. So. There are different kinds of American Leonardo Shasha's work. Uh, there is the real and difficult America in father's memory as Joseph Farrell this morning was remembering. And I want to show you some documents when uh, petition for naturalization of the father of Pasquale Shasha and when he came to the United States. Uh, so as we know, Pasquale Shasha lived here in New York City from 1912 to 1917 working in a laundromat and he joined the US Army during the First World War. <clears throat> and what remain of his memories is silence in a way. And so you, Shasha said, but he, so Pasquale Shasha never talked about it to us. For him, America was unacceptable, the unspeakable. Back in Racalmuto, he wanted to forget everything as if that period never had never existed. As we know, silence is one of the most powerful push for art. And so, especially uh, probably of silence for a father. And so in this case, Shasha started to reach and to look for literature, the American literature, American words, to fulfill that silence. So we perfectly know Americana, uh, published by, edited by Elio Vittorini and later um, Emilio Cecchi, and the many uh, different kind of novels that came to, uh, translated to Italy from Mondadori in the 30s on, and then obviously the Allies in 1943, there was another, yeah. the Allies, they actually realized as Italians realized that it was Italians that left Italy years before coming back to save the country. So that's what America, so brotherhood they meets again to save from dictatorship. Um, then Shasha started to write article. The first article by Shasha is on the Guardia in 1940, discussing the foreign policy of Roosevelt. In 19, 1944, Shasha published his first short article on American literature on the newspaper Vita Siciliana, in which the year after uh, he started reviewing Saroyan novel. In 1945, he started translating Walt Whitman, for example. It's the first and only experiment of translation. They actually, as Joseph Farrell pointed out in his book, is a rewriting of the poem using his own poetic. That's a very interesting, we don't have time, but it's a very interesting experiment. Um, another book review now of Truman Capote was published in 1949. In 1952, as we perfectly know, since yesterday night we presented at Shima, the art portfolio by Leonardo Shasha, first words to the portrait 
the lithograph by David Levine. Uh, so he published in 1952 uh, his very first words in the United States, the entry Italian literature on the American people encyclopedia yearbook. In 19, so before being Shasha, right? It was just a young Leonardo in a way. So the connection with the United States is very early on. In 1954, Shasha interviewed the laureate poet Alan Tate, and then in 1954, yeah, in the same year, thanks to the help of Alan Tate, he edited and directed the monographic number of Galleria, which was the editor-in-chief on the American literature, art, theater, or just to say aesthetic in general. There's a step ahead from Vittorini's Americana, in a way, because it's an analysis of different aspects of art in the United States. The same he did in 1955, letting Alfredo Rizzardi, a close friend of him from the University of Bologna, in translating uh, past and current at the time American poets. And in 1958 as well, another monograph number by Galleria, but this time centered on American poetry, new poetry. So as you can see, the editorial work by Sarsha is really, really important uh, following what Americana started. <clears throat> Then, as we know, from 1964 on, his novels are translated here in the United States. And from 1968, the New York Times asked Shasha to write some articles, besides the many book reviews that he had been re received for the books that he published here in the States. So, and as you can see, it's really nice, the, the definition of metaphysical mysteries, that's what Herbert Mitgen was defining his novels. Herbert Mitgang, this is the guy. Because we have a good idea of how Shasha came in contact with American culture, as I really briefly summarized today. And we know how there was the reception of his novels and why he was invited to write to the New York Times. But this is history, and, and as such, it can be easily documented, let's say now. But today I would like to discuss the dark side of history, those peculiar exchanges and relationships that stand behind the mainstream of events that create history as commonly intended. Today we will take two important examples, in my opinion, uh, but only two of the many that could be done, obviously, but we don't have time, so allow me just to quote two people. The first is the friendship between Shasha and Herbert Mitgang, a writer, journalist, and editor for the New York Times. The second is the correspondence he had with Isabel Wilcox, a New Yorker sociologist and an eager reader and traveler. The first, so Herbert Mitgang, will let us better understand the reception of Shasha in the United States, and the second, the reception of United States by Shasha. In his career as editor of the New York Times, Herbert Mitkan managed to make use of the Freedom of Information Act through which he had access to the archives of the National Archives and Record Administration, and therefore to various confidential and state secret documents. He thus published the documents of the FBI on the CIA against the patriotism of writers loved by Shasha himself, such as Oden, Truman Capote, Tennessee Williams, Hemingway, <coughs> Uh, Thornton Wilder and other American poets, novelists, and playwrights. Between Mitgang and Shasha, there was an exchange of letters that lasted from 1968 to 1985. And it was Mitgang himself who invited Shasha to the columns of the New York Times. As we can see, here is articles by uh, Mitgang. And as you can see, it was de dedicated entire pages, so it's kind of important. And here are the articles by Shasha for the New York Times, thanks to the collaboration and friendship with Herbert Mitgang. I quote from Mitgang, we would like you to write an article for the New York Times on the Belize earthquake, and above all, all the consequences and how people are doing. This is not a journalistic or article, since we already know what happened by human essay on the meaning of the earthquake for Sicily today. That's what Mitkan was specifying in a later dated March 1968. <clears throat> in the meantime, the news of the student protest reaches the United States and another earthquake, and Shasha was asked to write about it on the New York Times, criticizing the way in which Italian students put forward their proposal. And Shasha writes, 
All they seem to want is an easier way of getting along as before. In Southern Italy, the opportunism of their demands is particularly absurd, so much for the strictly academic aspect. Politically, the Italian student scene is far more complex and confused than the other European student revolts. So as you can see, the relationship and how Shasha was writing in the United States, introducing you guys to the Italian situation, European situation in 1968, in this case, during the student protest. This is the last article that Shasha wrote for the New York Times on Baroque spirit of a place and its people. Come back, let's come back to Mitgang. There are two books by Hertmer Mitgang, I believe, that surprisingly, surprisingly, surprisingly contain Shasha's articles. The first is America at Random, a century of comment on American Americans. Along the many authors in this book, edited by Herbert Mitkin, we can find Robert F. Kennedy, Arthur Miller, Archibald MacLeish, Nadine Gordimer, and Leonardo Sciascia, used to, demo, to, to show Americans themselves how Italy was looking at it. So that's a very important one. The second one is a wonderful title, Words <coughs> Still Count With Me, a chronicle of literary conversations in which we can find an interview to Sciascia Irra Calmuto, dated August 26, 1986. Among many other interviews, like Ignazio Silone, George Simenon, Vladimir Nabokov, Gord Vidal, etc., etc. The interview to Shasha is on his writing method, and the last question is Isn't he afraid that the mafia will harm him because he has exposed them in writings? And Shasha replied, The mafiosi aren't interested in literature, he said. Normally, the mafia confines itself only to a very well-defined danger, Mr. Shasha smiled. They are not worried about me. Who knows? The mafia might even be proud that I'm a Sicilian writer. So Shasha was describing with irony and sarcasm what Sicily, what mafia was and the relationship with literature. But another book is even more relevant, <coughs> relevant giving us a glance be, be, behind the scenes of publishing in the United States in 1960s. The Alfred Knopf files shows that in 1965, the FBI agent picked up a, I quote, current catalog over the counter at the publisher's office without pretext. The New York Bureau special agent in charge reported to Director Hoover in Washington that Knopf catalog contained, I quote, several thousand titles by, by about 800 authors, close of quotation. Unaware of the dossier mentioning her and her husband, Blanche, uh, Blanche Knopf, sent a cordial but innocent letter to John Edgar Hoover in 1964, enclosing a copy of Leonardo Sciascia's Mafia Vendetta, horrible title for the day of the hour. She describes, I, I quote from a letter, is a documentary novel translated from the Italian, which I believe will be of special interest to you. Close of quotation. Mr. Koff, say that its publication in Italy opened serious speculation in the Italian press about the extent of government involvement with the mafia. And then she added, seeking what sounded like a request from a promotional flag, and I quote, I hope you will let me hear what you think of it. Innocently, Mr. Knopf was clearly trying to have Shasha's novel approved by the FBI. She was kindly pushing Director Hoover to consider Mafia Vendetta just as, a good, just, just as a good book from an Italian writer. And Mitkan writes about it. Shasha, with whom I have had several talks in recent years in Palermo and at his country house in Racalmuto, deep in the Sicilian interior, hold the American Mafia and especially the romance about its contempt. As an, an author who has constantly written against the lassitude, the corruption of government and police, police authority, he would have shrugged the Sicilian shrug in amusement if he had been told that one of his novels had been sent to the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation for approval." End of quotation. Mafia Vendetta, <clears throat> or better in the second translation, The Day of the Hour, has been approved by the FBI, as we perfectly know since we have it. <laughs> And the project the Leonardo Sciascia and America <coughs> Culture <coughs> promoted by the Associazione Leonardo Sciascia <coughs> and the Comitato Nazionale del Centenario Sciasciano 
um, is unveiling many documents that will be of our interest to understand in depth the relationship between the writer and the American editors, publishers, journalists, and the FBI officers. But we would like to know <coughs> more because we want to go behind the so-called history and possibly understand what Shasha knew about the recent history of the United States. He surely read on the newspaper, magazine, and books on US, on the struggle for civil rights, the Cold War, the Vietnam War, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but he is a writer. And as Fabio Finotti said the other day, Rizzoli is a journalistic touch as a writer. And we are totally agree with that. So um, we think that we believe that the writer know uh, how to go beyond the borders of no or common knowledge. And so let's read what Shasha read about the United States. And the second person, so that I want to introduce you, is Isabel Wilcox from New Jersey. She is a scholar of rural sociology of small villages, and she was attracted to Sicily and curious to meet the writer and will visit that will visit several times in 1670s and 80s. Isabel Wilcox began reading Shasha's book in 1961, so before it was translated into English. She had a poor Italian, but still, she was making the effort. In 1963, they met for the first time in Sicily, talking about the South, the Italian, and the, and the Italian South and the American South as well, of the Confederate, Confederate States, in which the fighting against segregation was still in act. The struggle for civil rights in Mississippi is told by Isabel Wilcox through the transcription of a student's diary. In their speeches, summarized later in, later in letters, Shasha asked what the poor Americans lack, hope, while they don't lack shame. That's what Isabel Wilcox replied in one of the 28 letters that she sent him during the years. The, stu the, the student's diary is, much, is very interesting. She decided, this, this student decided to go from New York to Jackson, Mississippi to join the Council of Feder Federated Organization, a coalition of the civil rights movement, COFO, founded in Mississippi in 1961, the year before James Meredith uh, became the first African-American student admitted to the racially segregated University of Mississippi after the intervention of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy and the federal government. Isabel Wilcox student went to teach at Tougaloo College, where volunteers from all over the United States came to secretly teach to black students. In a moment of repression and segregation. Here is an excerpt of in, um, by her diary. July 26, 1964, 4 p.m. We have finally reached Jackson, the capital of Mississippi, where even the simplest business is complicated in the mincing atmosphere. Our friend has lost a suitcase. If they find it, she must give the address of Kofo for the shipment. Upon hearing the name of the organization, the airport employee is immediately hostile. 6 p.m., a fire truck runs down the street and stops in front of the restaurant for niggers, where we are <coughs> going to, and begins to block traffic. Volunteer students feel anxious and hope to get into the restaurant before the cops arrive. They advise us not to enter through the windows as so as not to attract attention and not to pull down the curtains. There is always an air of apprehension. Things not to do. Talk about Tougaloo College. Turn on the interior lights of the car while going through the, black, the back streets. Do not run out of gas. Do not waste time at traffic lights if there are mixed passengers, white and negroes in the car. 8 p.m. The father of a student spoke at the cough offices with a young white man who was attacked by a group of thugs while talk, walking on the street of Jackson in the company of a Negro. He ran away <coughs> and the Negro was beaten. 9 p.m. It's tough, huh? The cough car was set on fire. Uh, tear gas threw into a house inhabited by civil rights volunteers. Dynamite was thrown into the headquarters of House of Liberty, but fortunately it did not explode. 
10 p.m. The McGee brothers went to the cinema for whites. They phoned the Kofo office saying they were inside, they couldn't get out, as a crowd was outside waiting for them. The Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee, so CNCC, mobilized by sending a rescue team. Our car, with only blacks inside, ran to the scene while someone from the office held a McGee on the phone to give instruction and to find out what was happening in the meantime. Suddenly, McGee said he would be able to somehow get out without being seen. We tried to convince him not to do it while others tried to call the FBI. The police and the sheriff, and the, and the police and the sheriff. After a few tens of minutes, some policemen finally arrived and escorted the boys to one of our, of our car, but they, before they could arrive, a bottle of coke thrown by the angry crowd smashed on the car door and glass fragment injured one of the brothers in the eyes. It's a movie, it's a horrible movie. They took him to emergency room with one of our cars and they were going, some, someone shot the car without likely hitting it. A group of white gathers at the hospital and none of our people have been able to leave. At the CNNC, everyone called the Ministry of Justice in Washington, the FBI, the newspapers to report the incident. Nobody, want, nobody wanted to give protection. Harassment by police or civilians happens every day. The races with trucks or car patrols the streets and pass in front of our offices. The police patrol the streets looking for pretext to create trouble or small traffic violation and the rest without justification. Here are the words of a police captain reading. Niggers are happy and cheerful. They don't understand the idea of voting. Education will not help them. They attend the beautiful schools we have built for them. The Lord made them back black because they are inferior. You white people from the North make a big mistake helping them. On Tuesday morning, we found the staff working in our offices bent to the ground to collect the nails that the cops had scattered the night before. The atmosphere changes rapidly, from calm to apprehension. Answering outside the office in the cool of the evening, someone reminds us not to go under the street lamps. Or the, uh, if the phone rings and they warn us that a red Chevrolet is circling in a certain county, or one of our car can be found, and we worry until he comes back. George McGee was arrested yet again, the dirt in a week. A kind, not aggressive person walked with a group of boys singing freedom for all. They were arrested and George ar uh, arrested on charges of having made a procession without permission. He was held in prison, prison for pushing minor of the delinquency. His bail cost his father 150 bucks. Freedom for all, he was singing. The people of the South and sometimes even those of the North criticized the students who came here to volunteer for the civil rights of blacks, saying that they were either communist or pushed by communists. In the cotton field, they earned 0.6 to 0.9 dollars per day. In the past year in a small Mississippi town, a store has sold firearms worth a total of 36 millions. So this is the America sometimes that Shasha received and they have the opportunity to read from the, real, the, the direct voice of people that were collaborating and fighting for their civil rights. And finally, <coughs> 20 uh, days ago, I was saying 20 years ago, 20 days ago, I went to Jackson, Mississippi and I found the real documents that's telling the story exactly as I was telling you, I mean, reading you, the story of Maggie Brothers. And I think it's an important document just because to give more, you know, a, 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 a document, I mean, an official document on a story written by a student that we believe the student, but now we know that the story is even safe at the Kofu, Kofu uh, offices. Ron Jerkins is here, so I would like to add this. Sometimes culture, you know, is a strange uh, stream, right? So Afro American, thank you so much. Afro American, oh, some green now. Afro-American writers used to quote and to inspire by Dante Alighieri because they were using since the second half of 19th century on as a paladin of justice, right? And to struggle, struggle for against the hell in this earth instead of the other world. 
And this was, for example, Ralph Ellison, who at the time of segregation that we were talking about, Leroy Jones, Baraka, obviously. So they were quoting Dante and using Dante and Sasha, obviously, like Faulkner, like Dante, like Martin Luther King, they were fighting for the same exact reason, even if in different parts of the world. But this colloquium is on different parts of the world, right? East and West, they are meeting together for the myth and so the representation of reality through literature. And so let me read something special. Kenneth Cock, a nice uh, a poet here in New York City, once again, I just found it yesterday in an archive, in a wonderful poem titled My Olivetti Speaks, Italian style, the picture, the caricature from Levine as the one that made the picture, the, the, the caricature of uh, Shasha himself. He says, birds don't sing, they explain, only human beings sing. Rome inspired architects and sculptors and painters. The Lake Country inspired poets, Milton inspired kids, Perugino taught Raphael, Blake gave ideas to it, Shasha read Chronique Italienne uh, once every year, Byron learned something from Alexander Pope. Even the most unsentimental person is glad to see his home country again. And I think culture and the dialogue that we are analyzing this wonderful one a day and a half here at the uh, Instituto Italiano di Cultura is exactly about that. So we believe we, we belong to a place, but we can belong to another one because we are attracted from the same value. As exactly we can see the statue of Shasha in Ragalmuto or in Hamilton, Ontario. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Valerio. Now, <laughs> sorry, we're getting a little bit emotional. But now it's a great pleasure to introduce you, Walter Vecellio, that, as we all know, is a journalist and political activist. He collaborates as a columnist and commentator of numerous newspapers and magazines. Leonardo Sciascia edited the very important book La Palma va a Nord, Articoli e Interventi, 1977-1980, published in 1982. He's a member of editorial board of the scholarly journal Todo Modo, and he has been the president of the Associazione Amici di Leonardo Sciascia from 2000 to 2004. And so please, join me in welcoming. Well, uh, my English is very bad, and uh, it's better for me, for all, I speak in Italian. Uh, sono onorato di essere qui tra voi. Uh, qui negli Stati Uniti non c'è uno scrittore che non coltivi il sogno, l'aspirazione di scrivere il grande romanzo americano. E di scrittori ce ne sono tanti e tanti di qualità e alcuni da annoverare come classici eh, Mark Twain che secondo Ernst Hemingway è il padre della letteratura americana lo stesso Hemingway, Faulkner e molti altri ora forse dirò una sciocchezza ma per me il grande romanzo americano lo scrive un cineasta che si chiama Clint Eastwood se si prendono tutti i film che ha diretto Potere Assoluto, Million Dollar Baby, Gran Torino, American Sniper, Invictus e altri, fino a Cry Macho, sono storie di persone normali che a un certo punto si trovano a dover affrontare degli avvenimenti straordinari e a trovare in loro stessi le risorse per non uscirne stritolati. E c'è una buona parte di mito in questi film racconto, un mito amaro, disincantato, perché l'individuo vorrebbe vivere una vita in pace, tranquilla, e a un certo punto deve, avere, deve invece fare i conti con una realtà che non, non si può eludere. E per venire all'Italia, chi ha scritto, naturalmente secondo me, nel secolo che ci siamo lasciati alle spalle il grande romanzo italiano, Leonardo Sciascia, e che anche lui ha qualcosa di cinematografico. Eh, spesso in conversazioni private e anche in interviste, Sciascia diceva che i suoi racconti 
erano praticamente delle sceneggiature già fatte e portarli allo schermo era facilissimo. L'intera produzione di Sciascia è tutto sommato un grande e unico libro. Il racconto, la descrizione di persone normali a cui a un certo punto accade qualcosa di straordinario con cui devono fare i conti anche loro. E a fianco di questi racconti di taglio cinematografico, secchi, limpidi, essenziali, come sono i film di Clint Eastwood, c'è una sorta di diario, un Bedecker, che Shasha compila con metodo e con pazienza e per la nostra fortuna, perché è di grande aiuto per comprendere non solo il testo, ma il contesto, non solo la scena, ma anche il retroscena. E questo volume, intitolato Nero su Nero, Shasha lo pubblica nel 1979 e contiene riflessioni, dialoghi, suggestioni che sono state provocate da cose viste, vissute, da letture, la sua memoria. E a un certo punto c'è una nota che ci aiuta per il tema che cerco di sviluppare. Shasha riflette su alcune fotografie che degli inviati di guerra americani e inglesi hanno scattato durante la campagna di Sicilia nell'estate del 1943 e una di queste fotografie è di Robert Capa è quella che ritrae un soldato americano molto alto quasi inginocchiato che guarda un punto lontano che gli viene indicato da un piccolo eh, contadino pastore siciliano e che appunto gli indica con il bastone un punto una direzione Anni dopo sapremo che quel piccolo contadino o pastore è stato fucilato poi dai nazisti proprio perché colpevole di aver aiutato i soldati americani. Ed è il pretesto che viene usato da Shasha per ragionare sul mito americano. Soldati, figli, nipoti, comunque parenti o amici di emigrati dalla Sicilia e in Sicilia rimandati proprio per sfruttare questi legami familistici. Il piccolo contadino indica la strada giusta al paesano, all'amico, al parente ricco comandato dal suo buon presidente a venire in Sicilia a fare una buona e giusta guerra. E quelle fotografie, scrive Sciascia, dicono tutto, perché non c'è solo il contadino, il paesano, gli americani. Ci siamo anche noi, ventenni, con il mito dell'America che non ci veniva dai parenti e dagli amici, degli amici. Degli amici, vi lascio immaginare chi sono. Ma dalle appassionate letture cui Vittorini e Pavesi ci avevano avviato, di Faulkner, di Hemingway, di Steinbeck, di Caldwell, di Saurian, che ve ne sembra dell'America, chiedeva il titolo di un libro di Saurian tradotto da Vittorini, la libertà, la democrazia, il New Deal, la frontiera verso il mondo nuovo, era la nostra risposta. E si possono trovare in questa specie di indagine altre tracce utili. Le parrocchie di Regalpetra è uno dei primi libri pubblicati da Sciascia nel 1956 dall'editore barese La Terza. Nel capitolo Breve cronaca del regime, e il regime è quello fascista, si può trovare un passaggio interessante. Le vetrine delle librerie, scrive Sciascia, erano piene di libri sull'Etiopia e sulla guerra e ce n'era uno intitolato Io in Africa, con due F. Scrissi Africa in un componimento a scuola e il professore lo segnò in rosso. Non amava d'annunzio, né, disse, i dannunziani, da tre e un soldo. Mi fece un po' di bene. Passai le vacanze leggendo libri americani, non ricordo come mi fossero venuti tra le mani. Ritornai a scuola pensando che fosse finito il tempo delle manifestazioni. C'era invece la Spagna, ma ci stavamo alla stracca ormai. Non era la stessa cosa che per l'Etiopia, o forse noi eravamo un po' cambiati. Il commissario di pubblica sicurezza veniva mentre aspettavamo il suono della campanella per entrare in scuola e chiamava quelli che conosceva come animatori delle manifestazioni. E che non facciamo una bella manifestazione, chiedeva a tutti noi studenti. E noi, che cosa è successo? Chiedevamo. 
abbiamo preso Santander, diceva il commissario, e ci avviavamo alla federazione, ma durava la manifestazione mezz'ora. Restavamo poi a passeggiare con i libri sotto braccio, a discorrere di libri e di ragazze. Avevo scoperto John Dos Passos e c'era una ragazza che mi piaceva. Io credo che sia significativo questo passaggio. Il primo germe di antifascismo, di amore per la democrazia e per la libertà, portati da Dos Passos, dai libri di autori americani, chissà come trovati, da un insegnante che instilla con un segno rosso un primo contravveleno al fanatismo e alla retorica e l'attrazione per una ragazza. E Dos Passos è un autore che ricorre. Facciamo un salto di 22 anni. Sciascia rilascia a Gian Piero Mughini per il mensile Mondo Operaio una lunga intervista e racconta che da giovane ha subito l'influenza di alcune persone che gli hanno fatto da maestri e uno di loro lo era anche di mestiere, un professore di lettere, forse proprio quello che gli aveva assegnato quel giorno il rosso nel compito, che si chiamava comunque Giuseppe Granata. Introduce Sciascia ai testi di Voltaire, di Montesquieu, di Cesare Beccaria, di Piero Verdi, cioè di tutti gli illuministi sia francesi che italiani. Ma racconta sempre Sciascia, fu lui ad avvicinarmi alla letteratura americana, fu lui a prestarmi il primo libro che ho letto di Dos Passos, il 42esimo parallelo. Ora io apro una parentesi su questo romanzo perché credo che abbia avuto una certa influenza per quel che riguarda il mito. Il 42esimo parallelo, secondo un critico, un recensore del New York Times, è una linea mitica sulle mappe che taglia attraverso il cuore degli Stati Uniti. È stato osservato che si tratta della linea approssimativa che seguono, che seguono le tempeste delle montagne rocciose all'Atlantico. Un doppio simbolismo dunque, gli americani dell'Ovest e quelli dell'Est, legati da quella linea che attraversa il paese e il movimento che dall'Ovest è andato verso l'Est, dopo secoli di marcia inversa, simboleggerebbe la potenza affascinatrice del capitalismo industriale e delle sue promesse. Fin qui la recensione. Gli scrittori americani del Novecento. Cercia confessa di aver contratto un debito con loro in una lunga intervista rilasciata a due giornalisti del settimanale francese Le Nouvelle Observateur, pubblicata nel giugno del 78. Tra i 13 e i 17 anni, ma non più in là, ho avuto una grossa passione per D'Annunzio. La cotta mi è passata quando mi sono accorto che D'Annunzio era caduto dalla parte sbagliata, dalla parte del nazionalismo e del fascismo. Mi è passata grazie agli americani, Steinbeck, Caldwell, Faulkner e grazie anche a quello che si è potuto leggere di Hemingway sotto il fascismo. Ora, quanto questo specifico mito possa aver fatto presa su Sciascia lo possiamo naturalmente discutere, anche se con una certa cautela, perché al pari di tanti emigranti, l'avete citato poc'anzi, il padre dello scrittore Pasquale si è trasferito negli Stati Uniti dal 1912 al 1919 e un fraterno amico di Leonardo Sciascia, lo scrittore Matteo Collura, ci fornisce dei ragguagli utili su questo soggiorno americano nella voce America del suo alfabeto eretico. E si legge, suo padre, emigrato negli Stati Uniti nel 1912, vi rimase sette anni, facendovi anche il servizio militare. E dovette essere un'esperienza tutt'altro che edificante per lui, se tornato nella sua raccalmuto, non ne parlò mai in famiglia né tra gli amici. Così, negli anni in cui Leonardo era bambino nel suo paese, luogo tra i più lacerati dall'immigrazione in Sicilia, l'idea che si aveva di quel lontano continente era quella che lui avrebbe rievocato da scrittore. I racalmutesi hanno sempre visto l'America con terrore, come un destino particolarmente amaro e negativo. Quegli emigranti che temporaneamente tornavano ogni 5-10 anni e sembravano americanizzati, venivano guardati con disprezzo, come se fossero divenuti più stupidi di prima. L'America la si immaginava come un posto dove non si sapeva vivere, dove si sgobbava fino ad abbruttirsi, dove ci si inebetiva e ci si vestiva in maniera strana 
cravatte dai colori sgargianti e appariscenti per gli uomini, cappellini indescrivibili per le donne. Gli emigrati di ritorno li si distingueva anche per il loro dialetto arretrato. Dicevano bunaca per dire giacca e burcetta invece di forchetta e alla Calmuto questo faceva ridere e poi quelli si lagnavano, dicevano che il paese non era cambiato, che era sporco come prima e anch'essi ci disprezzavano. Guardavano con diffidenza i parenti come se tutti mirassero al loro denaro e magari era così. Ecco qui mi concedo un salto, perché è curioso, ma anche di qualche significato, come questi sentimenti, queste suggestioni e anche questi atteggiamenti restino in qualche modo immutati al di là dei luoghi e del tempo. È un cantautore italiano che forse non è azzardato definire anche poeta, modenese, si chiama Francesco Guccini, in una delle sue più belle ballate, Amerigo, del 1978, parla di un suo prozio emigrato in America ed è un continuo confronto con gli Stati Uniti reali e quell'America dove si sconta emarginazione, fatica e sconfitta e quella del mito che coltivava appunto Guccini, della fantasia, del viaggio fatto appunto con l'immaginazione e le immagini non si sovrappongano, restano distanti le une dalle altre. L'America di Amerigo è fatta di un lavoro duro, di sangue, di fatica, di birre di puttane, di giorni duri, di negri di irlandesi, polacchi ed italiani nella miniera, di sudore e di antracite, così canta Guccini. E l'altra invece è quella del sogno, provincia dolce, mondo di pace, l'America che era Atlantide, il cuore, il destino, life, sorrisi e denti bianchi su patinata, paperino, Ringo, gli eroi di Casablanca e Fort Apache. Ecco, alla fine Amerigo torna e come molti due soldi di giovinezza ormai finita, l'America in un angolo, l'America era un'ombra, nebbia sottile, l'America era diventata un'ernia, un gioco di quei tanti che fa la vita per dire boss per capo e ton per tonnellata. Ed è molto simile al padre di Sciascia, Pasquale, perché sono tutti e due taciturni, incupiti, amari come esperienza e come successiva vita. E quello per loro era il mito infranto. Ma l'America, questo miraggio, contemporaneamente lo troviamo integro nelle sue mille trame in una zia di Shash. E quindi convive nella stessa generazione. E questa zia di giorno in giorno si vedeva chiaro che l'unica persona della casa che le piacesse era mio zio. Ad uso di una mia zia era diventato un domestico Saroyan, celebrava l'America in chiave di falsetto, le buone cose, i buoni sentimenti dell'America, si squagliava come un gelato al calore della buona e ricca America. Io in un libretto che avevo portato i soldati americani, che avevano portato i soldati americani per educarci all'America, la commedia umana si intitolava, avevo tenuto Saroyan come una Bibbia. Ora incominciava a venirmi a noia, mi pareva fosse un gioco, uno di quei giochi fragili che dopo un buon pranzo certuni fanno con gli stuzzicadenti e la mollica. Saroyan era l'uomo finalmente sazio e grato che giocando con gli stuzzicadenti cantava l'America. Un critico si chiamava Walter Mauro, in un suo libro di 50 anni fa, Shash intitolato, fa un'osservazione interessante. In queste pagine si palesa la visione di un'America del tutto diversa da quella che durante il fascismo avevano realizzato intellettuali come Pavese, Etecchi e Vittorini. E la critica di Shash a Saroyan è una sorta di dissociazione del sogno americano neorealista, quale ultima e aggiornata versione appunto del mito. Un progressivo disincanto che tuttavia non impedisce, l'abbiamo visto poco fa, di dedicare a, nel dicembre del 54 un fascicolo della rivista Galleria appunto alla letteratura americana e Sciascia lo affida ad Alfredo Rizzardi che era fondatore della cattedra di letteratura americana e canadese all'Università di Bologna ed è un fascicolo estremamente interessante anche oggi 
perché troviamo interventi di eh, Claudio Gollier, di Fernanda Pivano, di Gianni Scalia, di Elio Vittorini e ancora oggi ha un suo valore. Ritorno adesso per un attimo a Dos Passos e alle ragioni che forse possono aver intrigato Sciascia Giovane che in quel romanzo trova quel respiro di libertà che il regime fascista non gli consentiva. Il 42 parallelo fa parte di una trilogia con una caratteristica interessante perché Dos Passos si appropria di una tecnica cinematografica che si può definire cineocchio. Il romanzo è costituito da ritratti, da dialoghi casuali, da dichiarazioni ufficiali, da scene di costume, da titoli e di brani di giornale. È un materiale basato su una tecnica di montaggio cinematografico che si ritrova nei film del regista eh, russo Sergei Eisenstein. E uno studioso che si chiama Kane Booker ha scritto che rappresenta l'esempio realizzato più pienamente di quello che gli scrittori e i critici degli anni 30 del secolo scorso chiamavano il romanzo collettivo. E i personaggi immaginari di Dos Passos, le vicende di cui sono protagonisti o da cui sono lambiti o che si intersecano, consentono all'autore di affrontare delle questioni, degli argomenti che sono spinosi ancora oggi, figuriamoci in quegli anni, l'omosessualità, le gravidanze non desiderate, l'aborto, le malattie venere, questo in una società, in un contesto repressivo o almeno formalmente puritano. E Sciascia dunque lo possiamo capire come ne resti affascinato a onta dell'esperienza negativa del padre. E torna all'intervista di cui ho fatto cenno, quella rilasciata da Mughini. C'è un passaggio interessante. Mughini gli ricorda tante, che tante volte ha parlato di una sorta di schizofrenia dell'intellettuale meridionale, scisso tra la realtà che lo circonda e i viaggi, perlomeno quello in mentali, in culture e capitali lontani. Sei mai stato partecipe di questa schizofrenia? Gli domanda. La mia prima infatuazione, risponde lo scrittore, fu per il mondo americano, che non mi apparve però come un mondo da visitare, ma da vivere attraverso i libri. È curioso, ad esempio, come io sia arrivato a Giovanni Verga, uno scrittore che a tutt'oggi non riesco ad amare completamente, attraverso una testimonianza entusiastica che ne aveva scritto un americano, William Burnett, l'autore di Piccolo Cesare. Ecco, questo scrittore è uno scrittore molto amato da Leonardo Sciascia ed è anche l'autore di un libro famoso, Giungla d'asfalto, che poi è stato portato nel cinema da John Huston. E a proposito del mito americano, forse una piccola rivelazione. Che cosa combina da ragazzo Sciascia in quel paese raccalmuto, isolato dal mondo e come cristallizzato nel tempo? Ecco, lo racconta il nipote Fabrizio Catalano, nell'appendice di un bel volume che lui ha curato assieme a Vincenza Ronica, Sciascia e il cinema. Da ragazzo mio nonno scrisse a diverse attrici americane, chiedendo loro una foto con dedica. Molte, in un mondo ancora più normale o comunque meno schermato dagli uffici stampa e dalla major, gli risposero nella libreria dello studio di mio nonno alla noce, la noce e la sua residenza estiva a Calmuto, ci sono ancora i ritratti di Mirna Loy e di Rosalind Russell e altre stanno in un album qualche anno dopo la morte di mio nonno, mia nonna me lo ha regalato. Ricordo uno scatto sublimente sensuale di Dolores del Rio. E questo era uno sciascia giovane. Eh, in America lui non ci ha mai messo piede, neanche quando scrittore affermato e senza problemi economici avrebbe potuto andarci. Eh, forse era la paura dell'aereo, forse non so per quale motivo, comunque è stato piuttosto all'America ad andare da lui e mi riferisco agli anni appunto della guerra quando gli angloamericani sbarcano in Sicilia nel 1943 e come abbiamo detto molti di loro erano figli o nipoti o comunque paesani mandati apposta perché in questo modo i comandi militari pensavano che sarebbero stati accolti con maggiore simpatia. E una ricola si ritrova nello sfogliare le pagine del primo dei quattro racconti che compongono le zie d'America. La madre del Lio Narrante racconta che in America c'era già una sua sorella ricca e con uno storo grande, storo, e aveva quattro figli e uno era già grande che poteva essere tra quei soldati che aspettavamo 
e l'America era per me lo storo grande di mia zia ed era una bottega grande quanto la piazza del castello, pieno di cose buone, di vestiti e di caffè e tocchi di carne. Ecco, ora si può osservare che dal mito, dall'idea della libertà e della democrazia derivata dalla lettura dei romanzi, progressivamente però poi si passa a una sorta di disincantata parodia, eh, si osserva e si denuncia anche un consumismo che già lascia intravedere quello che anni dopo accadrà fino a prendere atto che l'atteso esercito dei liberatori in realtà recava con sé anche manifestazioni di quell'arroganza che era tipica di uno dei generali più famosi di quella guerra, George Patton, comandante della Settima Armata, e Sciascia ricorda, si rese responsabile di alcuni sanguinosi eccidi, il più clamoroso e atroce, l'uccisione di 73 militari italiani catturati dopo la conquista dell'aeroporto dell a Biscari. Sopravvive solo un soldato italiano che testimonia assieme al cappellano militare americano. Solo un sergente americano viene condannato, formalmente all'ergastolo, in realtà scontato solo un anno di carcere, lo liberano perché, si giustificano così gli americani, sono preoccupati della possibilità che l'immagine americana potesse risultare compromessa, soprattutto davanti all'Italia, con la quale gli Stati Uniti avevano da poco concluso l'armistizio. Chiudo con una notazione che racconta un amico scrittore, anche lui siciliano, eh, che si, chiama, si chiamava Vincenzo Consolo, un'osservazione relativa alle sigarette. Notoriamente Leonardo Sciascia era un fumatore accanito, praticamente accendeva una sigaretta con quella che aveva fumato precedentemente. E le sue sigarette, racconta Consolo, erano le Chesterfield, le sue preferite, che fumava dal tempo dell'arrivo delle truppe americane in Sicilia. È un mito anche questo, che veniva aspirato con voluttà e che contemporaneamente poi va in fumo. Vi ringrazio. Thank you very much, especially for the last sentence, that was really nice. So we have 10 minutes uh, or even more for any question if you may have. For Comments? Just at the end of a long day. I think end long but fruitful. Before tomorrow, I don't miss tomorrow, obviously. We are just half day, we will be free at one. Any comments, any final uh, remarks? The last article Shasha wrote for the New York Times in 1986. So, discover this entire life. Then, uh, because uh, th there are not other kind of direct collaborations, obviously reviews on Shasha's books are published on The Nation, uh, on the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, so here and there. But I think it's the perseverance of Herbert Mitgang that changed completely the situation. And in letters, um, Mitgang actually put Shasha in contact with many editors, uh, writers, American I mean obviously, translators, and so on. So it was Mitgang there who is the flame of all that. And prob probably no one else was asking him, you know, just, and, and then Mitgang took several times the plane to go to Sicily to meet the writer. Julia. Yeah, the first article was 80 bucks, and then they changed to 125 bucks per article. But for an Italian, I think be paid so much in a way at that time. Not too bad. The journal paid just right. That's what the question? And to translate the, the New York Times, uh, 
editors translate so the Shasha send articles in Italian. Is the New York Times, so I think they had translators in the next door, you know. The, Yeah, not not the one by the he wrote on New York Times. I don't believe, but sure there are many that are translated in. Uh, yeah, Francesco, what do you think? It was uh, especially in South America there is a resonance of Shasha, that's for sure. But I don't know if there are books on Leonardo Shasha in Spanish or in Portuguese. Ah, certo. Yeah. No, no, she's... You know, we have the um, Lezioni Shashane, so it's uh, many lessons on Leonardo Shasha's works around the world. And we went from Australia to the United States, from Middle East to Paris, to France, and so on. And, um, and actually, one of the uh, locations they would like to make another Lezioni Shashane is exactly Southern America. Now that we are covering North America, next colony will be South America. <laughs> That's kind of, I mean, I'm kidding, obviously, but actually your question is pertinent because the attraction and the similarities between Spaniard literature and Italian and the love of Shasha for Spain, Spain, for example. So there are a lot of connections that I think has to be investigated. So thank you for your question. Yeah, it's a good moment. I think one of the reasons why you no, know, we are here, but the fact that your first of all and Rizzol and Shima were coming to the association is so and, and the audience in, in the three occasions like today is so powerful and so nice to us that I think it's the time to investigate if a translate a new translation probably or a old translation with a new introduction. I mean something refreshing some publication, because if you go to Rizzoli Library, you have some copies, two or three of some Shasha novels in Italian, but you have none in English. And you cannot find, as Francesco was saying, I think yesterday, the, on Amazon, you can find first editions for a lot of money that students cannot afford. And so we are thinking to reach some, or university press, but that's dangerous, or, I mean, or 
Ah, okay. <laughs> or another kind of publishing house that I think is the time to say, okay, we went to the United States, they were so great. What do you think? Do you want to publish? Thank you so much. Sí, sí, Yeah, sure. I think we have to come back to the 60s and 70s in which American people like Herbert Mitkang or Adrian Falk that was translating Shasha, they write to many publishers asking, please, why don't you start translating the essays as well, not just those. So actually that was the point, that was the direction that they were taking, asking a publisher or people just to put together and translate something like that. So I think we have to come back to the point and go ahead. That's the thing. And hopefully our meeting today, tomorrow and the other days is the first part that can be convinced someone. So thank you very much for your question because you gave the answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Absolutely. But don't forget, in 2018, there was republished the Romanzo di Ferrara by uh, in the hand, yeah, here in New York. And so that's an important step because if you read Bassani, then you can read Chash. Yeah, exactly. And so probably that's why we are here in a way, just because we were welcoming so much from you. So I want personally to thank you very much for today, long, interesting day. But before going, I think it's time to celebrate two birthdays that we have today. And one is Professor Francesca Maria Corrado. So happy birthday to you. And before we start singing, there is another birthday. There is Giulia Pellizzato. So now we can sing all together in time. So thank you very much again. See you tomorrow at 9, not later, not before. And thanks again for the hospitality.